Hello and welcome to the eighth episode of the Nations of Charlemagne, the Great Interregnum, the Northern Crusades and the Ossidlung. Very lucky as always to be rejoined by Marcus after his um, uh, temporary illness from last week, but very lucky to have you back on Marcus. How are you, sir? Indeed, I'm um, I'm well, thank and Boyd uh, from from recent uh, from recent events. So um, yes, very glad to be back, and very uh, very happy to join the crew, and very happy to have all the guests. So yes, nice to be back. Thank you. And absolutely wonderful to have you back, Marcus. And of course, joined as always by my wonderful co-host Columba. Oh, it's good to be here, gentlemen. I'm looking forward to this one. Wonderful. Now, just a quick proviso going on the subject. This is probably the most complex um, subject we've I've ever had to um, do on this channel. Um, I've had to try so and mesh, up, guys. <laughs> mesh all of these um, uh, seemingly disparate historical threads together to form some sort of overarching narrative for the next um, 200 years of German history. But all of it is essential. I can't really admit any of it because this is crucial and formative, not only for the next um, 100 years you know, or 500 years of European history, but for European history in general as well. So without further ado, I'll just offer a brief summary. In the wake of the um, annihilation of the House of Hohenstaufen in the 1250s and the 1260s, the empire enters a long period of um, internal decline and decentralization with three principal families fighting over the office of the empire. Nevertheless, as the office of the imperial of the office of the emperor himself diminishes and power flows more and more to the local principalities the newly established and cemented prince electors and the imperial cities and free cities so that by the end of this period towards the death of the emperor sigismund in 1437 the empire has become definitively and constitutionally decentralized meanwhile at the same time owing in part thanks to this decentralization we see a massive expansion of german settlement in the east facilitating by um, individual colonizers creating free cities and by, of course, the Northern Crusades, which are beginning in the 1140s. So beginning this um, topic, we're just going to go back to the period of the Etonians, the Salians and the Hohenstaufens to talk about um, where the German um, Slavic frontier was and what the situation um, at the frontier was. So starting off, we have the Germans and the Slavs. Um, before I sort of start talking, is there any Anyone, any sort of contribution anyone wants to make about the um, the situation of um, the German Slav border around the year sort of um, nine hundred? Oh, I, I, I couldn't say a lot, I'm afraid. All right, I, well. there's not there's not a lot to say, but what's kind of ironic is uh, you know for anyone who's familiar with the passage of history from this time point onwards to our modern era, the um the German well the, the sort of frontier of German um, culture and of German uh, of the German sphere, you might say ironically falls upon the Oder River, which is strange enough the border they drew after nineteen forty five. Well even, well, even to even to the um, Marcus it's even to the west of that. It's not even as far as the Oder River. I mean as Quite, you can see yeah. on this map on the left, there are these um shaded regions. Uh the definitive extent of German civilization really from nine hundred until eleven hundred was actually the Elbe River towards mm. the traditional boundaries of where you can see the, the Roman province of Germania, the old borders of um, East Francia. No, even the um the Oder settlement yeah doesn't become confirmed until the Vendish Crusade. You might oh, say that um, it's occurring at this point rather than being solidified, possibly. Hmm. I was just going to, um, um, how, how clear cut was this, with this divide? Was there, was there some, um, you know, German settlement on the other side and Slavic settlement, some movement, um, you know, or was it really um, that, that clear cut? Well, yes, let me, let, well, let me get into it. Or So uh, again, you can just... Uh, contributors, um, either of you see fit as we go along. So, uh, as I mentioned, the traditional frontier of um, East Francia is at the Elbe River. And um, obviously, it's demarcating as well the stem duchies of uh, uh, Thuringen, uh, Thuringia, and Saxony. Um, in terms of what goes on over the Elbe River between the Elbe and the Oder, um, there is settlement by a group known as the Palabian Slavs or the, um, the Western Slavs, which you know aren't the Bohemians or the Pomeranians or the Poles or the Moravians. And these are basically divided into uh, different subsets, different sort of tribal affiliations. So we have the um, uh, 
the Obotrites, we have the um, Veleti, which will later be known as the uh, Viltsi, we have the uh, Lutici, and we have, of course, the Sorbs. And um, just to mention, the Sorbian Slavs are still in Germany today, in East Germany. There are around um, 20 to 30,000 of them. Um, in fact, many of the Germans in the later expansion would actually be assimilated by the Sorbs, not vice versa. So there is still a little holdout of um, Slavic mm -hmm. um, civilization west of the west of the Oder River. Um, in terms were these, of um, were, were these Polybian Slavs not um, not um, responsible? Because of course you had the um, you know slightly earlier than slightly earlier than this, I suppose you had the contest between um, you know Charlemagne, the Franks, and the Saxons. I'm pretty sure the Polybian Slavs um, um, did they not ally with the Saxons um, against the Franks? Uh, yes, they were. Again, they were principally allied because of their um, all of them, of course, adhering to paganism. They were the last, yes. some of the last holdouts in um, Central Europe with regards to um, paganism. And again, in regards to how long this um, group, uh, the Germans refer to them as the Venden, or you know, transcribed in English as the Vens. Um, the Vens occupied this region, um, you know, from at least the seventh century onward from the ninth century. So entering that vacuum which the Eastern Germans had left during the um, the Great Migrations. And, um, you know, some of the um, tribes, such as the um, Obertrites, would, um, you know, create principalities in modern day Holstein and Mecklenburg. So, you know, what we can definitively see is Germany today. Um, most of our understanding of these groups comes from a ninth century source. And again, we can't actually attribute the source. So um, history, historiographically, he's simply known as the Bavarian geographer, for which we have the description of the cities and the lands north of the Danube. And this comes from around the time of Charlemagne. Charlemagne as with the Saxons, nominally subjugates the um, uh, the Slavs around this region, but of course, you know, it's only nominal. They basically return to independence after Charlemagne leaves, and we have the weak period of um, Carolingian kings. Yes, and then so, they, and then we and then we have the revolt, right? Which is in what the the late nine hundreds, mid nine hundreds. Well, interestingly, um, before we get to that phase, um, of course, this goes back. If anyone you know wants to understand a bit more of the context of this, I will redirect you to episode five of this series, the formation of the Holy Roman Empire, because um, Otto the Great, in addition to um, in ad addition to you know, defeating the Hungarian and the Magyar invasions. Um, he and his father, Henry the Fowler, had begun the first serious attempt to subjugate and extend the boundaries of the empire, as you can see on this map, up to the um, the Oder River, as um, Marcus was suggesting. And, um, you know, the first sort of great battle in between the Vens and the um, the imperial forces, you know, under Otto the Great, or later to be the imperial forces, only seven years after this, uh, we have the 955 Battle of Raxa, after which um, Otto defeats a numerically superior Vendish coalition under the leadership of the tribe, the um, Abderites. And from this, we have the creation of several marches east of the Elbe. We have um, Hermann Bilung creating the Bilung March in modern day Mecklenburg. And the rest is created as the um, uh, Marca Geronis or the Saxon East March, or sometimes referred to as Ostmark, um, which mm. is established under um, Gero. And um, this is a period under which the uh, the Sorbs in the south, which is um, Lusatia, what we consider the modern day Saxony, um, are basically incorporated into the empire, although they undergo a very slow period, uh, process of assimilation, which, as I mentioned, hasn't even been, you know, um, this, there are still Sorbs in Germany even to this day. And um, this is where we have, you know, you can say the first attempt to colonize this region for the Germans. And the crux of this um, uh, colonization effort originates around Otto the Great's creation of the Archbishop of Fork of Magdeburg, which I discussed again on that um, stream, episode mm. five. Um, the reason for the Archbishop of Magdeburg, of course, being crucial is that it's right on the periphery of, you know, it's right in the, the heart of these um, newly conquered territories. And it acts as a, basically a focal point for the conversion and assimilation of mm. most of these um, uh, West um, Sl Slavic, you know, um, peoples west of the Oder River. Sure, yeah, and I assume it served um, sort of administrative purposes as well, right? Because I mean, I yes. mean re relative, relatively speaking, um, um, you know, the Slavic territories at this time had, um, I mean, even in the German territories to the west, I mean, it wasn't particularly um, um, great administratively, but but I mean, the Slavic situation was 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 very primitive, relatively speaking. I mean, I mean, well, that, that seems to I hate, seems to extend I, I quite ha far. I hate to um, I hate to generalize when it comes to the Slavs because the obviously the Moravians, the Bohemians, had created um, Greater Moravia, which had um, a century earlier it had converted to Christianity, and that would later form the basis of the Kingdom of Bohemia. In the East, the Poles had of course converted to um, Christianity, and they had um, established 
establish their own um, principality later, later the Kingdom of Poland. Whereas periodic, whereas, you know, in contrast to that, these rather, um, you know, these Christianized, um, somewhat solidified and stable um, Slavic regimes in Bohemia and um, in Poland, we have a, you know, a loose tribal confederation and a very much pagan existing in this area between the, the Elbe and the Oder River. So no, this, um, ap this broad application towards the Slavs really doesn't sort of exist here. And mm. um, I think the, the interesting factor here is that- Well, um, I suppose what I was trying to point out is that the church acts as a civilizing force here right? yes and indeed, exactly and indeed and indeed amongst the eastern slavs um um we do have we do have a more complex state system because they were christianized first but i just wanted to um um highlight highlight that, that the church is acting as um the vehicle for all of these um all of this state formation all of this colonization throughout this period and in particular, they do this through the organization of the diocese, you know, and periodically the creation of a diocese, the bishopric, would act as the creation of a local administrative center, hence the necessity of creating the um, the Archbishopric of Magdeburg. Um, nevertheless, getting to what you mentioned, Columba, which is the, um, the Slav Revolt, um, this, of course, is a failed first attempt at um, colonization. Um, we have the leadership um, of Magdeburg being led by... Um, uh, one uh, Archbishop Edelbert, which is no known um, posthumously as the Apostle to the Slavs. Um, nevertheless, he dies in um, 981, and his successor encounters, you know, increasingly bitter opposition to the forced conversion of the Slavic populations. And the Slav the Slav tribes wait. They wait until the empire is particularly vulnerable. And um, the moment comes when we have the death and we have the defeat and death of um, Otto II, um, first at the Battle of Stilo against the um, Saraceni in, um, in southern Italy. And ultimately, you know, he dies a year later from this. And it's from this um, political and spiritual center of the, um, the uh, Palabian Slavs um, at um, the city of Retra, which is in modern day Mecklenburg, that um, the Lutici uh, form a coalition uh, but basically, you know, a tribal confederation linking all of these groups um, under attack. And um, not only, you know, do they drive out the Germans, but they successfully sack um, many cities east of the um, the Elbe. They even sack Hamburg during this period. Yes. In terms and and of, they totally check the, the, the German colonization efforts, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's basically you know, near definitive. So from this point on, the because, again, the empire is, you know, weakened from this temporary setback in Italy and because the empire is already overstretched and there is a minor um, emperor in the form of Otto III, you know, later the, um, the Italian dynasty will make way for the Salian dynasty. Um, we have basically the local Duchy of Saxony can only hold on to the frontier of the Elbe River. And so from this point on, and, and again, it must be also noted that um, Henry II, St. Henry, um, you know, first of all, they rely on the Germans, the, the, the empire rely on the Polish um, Slavs against the, um, uh, the Lutwi, Lut oh my goodness, sorry, the um, Lutici Confederation coalition. And um, then basically Henry II resolves, okay, well, it's better to have a buffer state between the Kingdom of Poland and the empire. So we'll preserve the independence of the Lutici Confederation. And so this political decision by Henry II not to, as you can see on this map, not to go over the Elbe River again, just to consolidate the um, possessions in Lusatia and Sorbia in the south, basically means that this area from 985 until 1140 is, you know, left alone by the Germans, and it remains uh, stalwartly pagan and independent during this period. So, you know, almost alone in contrast to areas in Central Europe that this region yeah, is pretty much surrounded uh, and it stays this way for how long I mean at least over 100 years 150 years well like I said yes 985 until um, 1140 which is um, which is quite incredible um, when you think <laughs> about it it really shows you how um, disordered the situation was in the Empire at the time you know? well, <laughs> well well two things to consider here if I may um, I want to make two brief points one's broadly historical one and that is even though these regions we're talking about were outside the periphery of the ancient classical imperial Rome of, of the height of the classical world, um, it's interesting how with the collapse of Rome, we and we've sort of touched on this in our past dreams, where um, in place of Roman forums and um, plazas and senate houses and bathhouses, uh, the church... The, certainly in the West, um, the, the Greeks do it in the East as well, obviously the Bulgarians and, um, and some of the, um, the people coming by the step. But the, the Catholic Church does this with archdioceses and bishoprics and churches and monasteries and sort of acts as this sort of cohesive civilisa civilizing force um, 
in place of what the Romans did previously. That's certainly how I observe this anyway. Yeah. I mean, the church at this period is, 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 a, is a truly sort of international organization, right? In, in so many different ways. I mean, you have, um, I mean, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury is like an Italian and what have you, you know? I mean, there's this well, idea of, um, the this church of as, was born in Russia, so, yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there, there's this idea of the church as sort of empire at this time. Mm. Um, um, and so it has this, um, broad uniformity in its approach, no matter where you go. Yeah. But of course it, but of course it adapts in terms of, um, um, it does. You know, minor minor things and also um you know i mean the architecture but even then i mean you, you see um remarkably broad um similarities across the, the this vast area and even if we wish to be slightly pedantic even if we wanted to don't want to call it imperialistic we can certainly call it sort of hegemonic in a cultural context as well you know um it spreads the use of latin alphabet for instance you know it spreads the use of a sort of a uniform um you know religious ceremony which wouldn't have occurred at this point in time in history in these states without the presence of the church, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it's, it also encourages, I mean, we've talked about this, it encourages, um, 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 you know, economic activity of all sorts that were, were, was alien and unknown, you know, I mean, I mean, new forms of agriculture, new forms of architecture, um, craftsmanship, and what have you. It is, in, it is in every sense a civilizing force. And I assume I am just going to go in this direction, so I won't steal too much thunder, but because we're at this point, certainly that first map is a, is a representation of, of um, the German states at, in, ten, in the 1030s, but um, definitely their attitude and their perhaps their methodology towards this process of, um, of Germanization and eastward expansion, um, the, the Osleilung, um, takes a different dimension, I suppose, with the success of the capture of Jerusalem in 1099 and the um, establishment of the, you know, the, the states of Auslamer. Yes, and um, yeah. Well, just to to illustrate that point, because that leads quite nicely onto the um, the Vendish Crusade. Just one little point I want to make is that um, it's important to note that despite the fact you know imperial authority is going to be you know relatively centralised throughout the Etonian and Selian, and obviously the Hohenstaufen dynasties. Um, after Henry the Second, emperors seldom take an interest in this region. This is you know beyond basically any of their direct interest. You know either their territorial interests, their dynastic interests, or you know, really, even their um, economic interests or their, you know, military interests, they're basically al allowing these um, independent duchies to deal with the threats. And periodically, it's considered we have... quite peripheral, isn't it? Yes, very then, peripheral. Yeah. And um, so basically, we have this period where, um, you know, in, in terms of the the actors most wanting a reconquest, the um, you, you mentioned the civilizing force of the Bishoparics Columba. Uh, Columba. Um, we have the creation of a bishopric in Brandenburg, and we have the creation of a bishopric in Havelburg. And one of the results of this is essentially, you know, these bishops are now dispossessed by the um, the, the Slavic uprising. Um, they return to the imperial court and they agitate essentially for the reconquest of these territories. You know, Havelburg will become one of the centers for the Vendish Crusade. Um, but apart from that, you know, um, all the localized attempts to expand into this territory um, do fail. So it, it takes an impetus like a crusade to um, you know, reverse the situation. So building on the, um, the first crusade, as you, as you mentioned, Marcus, um, we have the Magdeburg letter. And again, the Archbishop of um, Magdeburg, the, the center of this um, form of Christianization process, the Archbishop Forex still exists. And within the circle, which also includes the Bishop Forex of um, uh, the Bishops of Brandenburg and the Bishops of um, Havelburg, uh, we have the Magdeburg letter. And the Magdeburg letter is basically, you know, trying to create a justification that the Crusade should expand their scope, not just from the Outremer, not just from the Holy Lands, not just from Jerusalem, but we should consider that the Slavic areas, you know, are, are basically part of Christ's kern. We should liberate these territories and we should you know avail ourselves of the territory's resources and territory and continue this conquest until there are basically no pagan slavs until essentially they'd all been converted or they had been deleted yes and of course the 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 declaration of a crusade it adds um I mean, of course, you have already have these quite base material concerns you know we want to exp we want to expand our territory we even want to you know, um, 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 get rich basically. Um, but, but, but there's this strong, um, 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 theological and spiritual pool of, you know, the remission of your sins, which, which draws knights from all over Europe. 
Yes, and that's um, a general point to be mentioned, you know, regarding all crusades that um, uh, dispensation and, you know, um, forgiveness of, um, you know, uh, of temporal sins is a huge factor. This idea of redemption through crusades is, of course, you know, a huge factor in motivating, you know, recruits from all walks of life in Christendom. Uh, uh, but um, getting to the, the Vendish crusade in particular, um, the first action taken was actually prior to the crusade. The crusade isn't um, inaugurated until 1147 as part of the second crusade, but in 1140, um, the Count of Holstein begins to invade Palabian settlements in what we now know as um, Mecklenburg, and crucially for the discussion on the Hanseatic League later on, um, he forms the, the city of Lübeck, which will be one of the first of these new um, eastern cities. From um, from that point of view, from and again, this is where we also have the interaction with, um, you, you can say, one of the last sort of great um, Vendish leaders. Um, what's his name? Just Nicklot. Um, uh, and um, from 1147, as I mentioned, as part of the Second Crusade, um, Pope Eugenius expands the you know this this right of dispensation this um this act basically to um crusade to apply to the vens and the pagan vens and um what's also important to notice as i mentioned in terms of the decentralized nature of this expansion eastward uh the empire which is now under the uh, the rule of the hohenstaufens takes no formal role in this crusade instead it's these um lesser local nobles such as the Ascanian nobility the vetin nobility the vetins of course will you know rule saxony until 1918 and um the schauenburger you know families and of course under right. the leadership of the bishops of um Havelburg. um and again this is also a multinational force this doesn't just um again just uh, putting you know um a reference in the fact that this isn't just german expansion these crusades are truly multinational so this um the, the crusades you know involve the danes and they involve the poles in addition to saxons and what's also you know interesting is that um from the north so north of the the river Main, north of franconia when we get to areas such as saxony and um, thuringia uh, they are much more invested in the vendish crusade and I, the vendish crusades get a lot of recruits from north germany but um when it comes to the southern crusades when it comes to the um, second crusade a lot of their recruits come from southern germany and italy so it shows you where the um the, again the direct interests are aligned you know the mm -hmm. the saxons have a, a vested interest in uh, prosecuting the vendish crusade so it seems, the, um, the, uh, the, sorry, so, sorry, Marcus, but um, no, you know, they, they headed up here, they headed up the Baltics, headed up to the north. Um, what was the situation with, um, because I mean, if my geography doesn't fail me at that point, you're getting up towards, you know, the Volga and that area. And wasn't, was there not already, um, um, Germanic settlement in that area? Um, in no, this period? Well, no, 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 no. Um, the Volga is, it's not really featured on this map. It's much further to the east. I mean, much just further up. Yes, just uh, and south, just just at the corner of this map, where you can see the um, Ingria, the Ing Ingerland, uh, we have the River Neva, which is the basis of modern day Saint Petersburg, which is the um, the the Republic of Novgorod, which is you know one of the principal um, uh, Russian principalities up until the rise of the Duchy of Muscovy. No, what we're talking about the you know the rise of the Volga Germans. That's going to be like a, a later phase of um, expansion. Um, you know, much later relative to all this, you know, during this time, you know, the 13th century we're talking about, uh, the Volga was dominated by the Golden Horde. It was dominated by the Mongols. So, um, you know, Russia oh, didn't even course. have a, didn't even have a presence during this time. But um, yes, just... And, and also German presence in Russia was a part, was um, facilitated by Russian policy too, because... Yes, you know, but, uh, it, was, it was a state policy as well for them. Yes, and it's much, but it's much later on. So, um, mm, yeah. Well, so just, just, just I, I wanted to, just I wanted to briefly interject, just because um, Columba was um, just making that point there. Was that um, was that um, with the with the the crusade up north, what we see is um, something to compare with because really what there are because the crusades are kind of treated like a bit of a monolith, right? They're sort of you know it's Jerusalem, it's it's Christians and Arabs, and it's far more multidimensional than that and i mean we will obviously cover this in the stream and probably attend to it elsewhere in the future as well but what what is worth considering is that the the crusades to the east out Rema, are oversea or overland by, uh, through the byzantine empire and through anatolia and they're logistically almost a nightmare to consider they they are they are so far beyond the the, the center point of european power um away from these sort of crusading latin states um, if you look at the Spanish Reconquista, and in the case with these northern sort of eastern crusades by the Teutonic Knights, what you have essentially is campaigns that are situated on their doorstep. And the and the discrepancy which you made, AM, about um, the southern German and Italian knights going to the Holy Land and these uh, Saxon 
and um, and you know sort of essentially Westphalian Germans and, and Northern Germans far more likely to attend these Northern Crusades demonstrates that even at this point in time, um, and you know, and has been the case in many other countries in history also that certain population centres based upon the regions in which they live and based upon proximal enemies they have will be compelled to make strategic decisions which are, uh, how can I say, sort of contingent upon their, you know, necessities or contingent upon their interests. I mean, you know, we sometimes look at people in the past as being a bit, you know, you know dumb or ill-educated or whatever, but it goes to show you that even at this point in time, these people are thinking in this way strategically. You know, they have these, um, uh, you know, uh, inclinations to do what is in their interest yeah of course and, and, then, and then at the same time i mean what you mentioned briefly there that the russians um later on um invited germans is that not something that we see as well quite a lot is that once um you know an area has been um um subjugated uh, and some sort of authority has been established um um migrants from sort of the, um, the german heartland are encouraged to come in, in large numbers i believe um um, um, Albert the Bear, who was one of the the leaders of this crusade, didn't he invite some thousands to come and to come and join him? Uh, to my knowledge, yes. Yeah, um, and and this happens a lot, and I think um, um, part of the reason for this, and this is something that we wanted to go into in terms of um, um, the broader reasons for these crusades. I mean, you do have the um, the the theological considerations, right? But I mean, th this period in general, if we're speaking more broadly, I mean, I mean th this is the beginning of what gets called the medieval warm period, right? So um, um, agriculture is uh, is becoming much more productive. Um, populations are skyrocketing um, in all of the areas that have become um, 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 civilized and stable, you know, France and Germany. Um, and so people are, people are looking for land, people are looking for, for opportunities, um, 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 I mean, and and also as a result, of the situation becoming more stable. Um, um, of course, this is good for the people living and, there. But and, if you're and, and if you're an opportunistic, has, has sorry, as well at this point, population growth has stopped this, this time. This began to rebound because of the warm period and because of an increase in agricultural production. Yes, uh, but then you also have um, um, because of this more settled situation, um, many of the perhaps more um, adventurous or, or opportunistic um, 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 aristocrats, especially you know the second sons of some family. Um, um, yeah, I mean, th this, sons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they all want they all want to head off and, and grab a piece of land for themselves. You know, I mean, yeah. that's one of the the prime justifications behind um, or 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 prime pr prime draws of the the Crusades proper that we all know in the Levant as well. Yeah, quite. So getting on to, sorry, so getting on to, you know, the process of the crusade, um, the Vendish crusade is actually, in terms of its, you know, direct military implications, it would seem on the purpose that, you know, it hadn't actually achieved that much. I mean, uh, Niklot, the uh, leader of the um, um, Obotrites, is able to, you know, succeed Successfully make quite a quite a lot of defense uh, defensive moves in the very marshy terrain. I think it's also important to note that you know this region was referred to as you know, some of the worst um, land in Germany. It's ironic here that we have the basis of Brandenburg, which will be the center of modern Germany. It's you know, basically it's, you know founded in the the worst, most boggy part of Germany, where it's basically yeah. just um, ruinous, um, impoverished marshes. I mean, in that, terms that, of that, that would that would be one of the big reasons I think um, why. Um, uh, many of the emperors and many of the, the the lords were content to sort of leave um, some of these areas for so long is because they had been so um, so neglected and so underworked and they were so so unproductive. You know, I mean, I think yes, um, I mean you mentioned like the same um, the same motives um, the same motives um, the Romans considered. Yes, you mentioned um, Albert the Bear. Of course, Albert the Bear will be famous. I mean, he's an Ascanian, obviously, and that'll be the, the first um, dynasty of the House of Brandenburg. The House of Brandenburg, which will later give us the Kingdom of Prussia. Um, he founds the next um, uh, Margravate of um, Brandenburg in 1157, and that'll later become an electorate. So in terms of setting up a, a northern power base, even though it's in the um, some of the worst land in Germany, um, we are seeing the creation of these new independent principalities, which are going to have a, a huge effect on the, um, the progress of the rest of the rest of German history. I mean, in terms of again, talking about um, you know, lack of imperial interest. I mean, one of the um most notable uh, prosecutors of this war is of course Henry the Lion of the House of Welf, who is the principal adversary to um Frederick the First Barbarossa, who is again focusing most of his attention on subjugating the um the Italian states at this point in time. So whilst he's doing that in the north, the um independent vassals more or less 
virtually independent, are you know committing to increasing the sizes of their own domains in the east. And again, as you mentioned, Columba, a lot of these um, you know lordlets, all of these um, lesser sons of nobility, obviously have an impetus of, and of course, joining the church, which is a natural career path of going on crusade and carving out these um, new independent um, uh, principalities. But then again, I think it also should be noted is that one of the effects of the Vendish Crusade is that it's not just German. There's also Danish political interests. I mean, one of the most thoroughly conquered regions is, of course, the um, the island of Ugen in um, um, a modern day Mecklenburg um, of Pommern. And um, that region, you know, is thoroughly conquered by the Danes. And, you know, really, with, when we have the collapse and the, the fall of Henry, um, Henry the Lion of the House of Wealth, it is the Danes who exercise a, um, a principal sort of military um, presence in the 13th century. So when it comes to the German expansion, which we'll get into after this, um, we're seeing a very much a decentralized process, again, led by um, ordinary people as a result of this massive uh, population surge. But um, moving on, what um, the Vendish Crusade does... I'm just sorry, but, but um, just to give an idea of this population surge, I mean, you're talking within within a hundred years maybe 200 years the population doubles triples you know i mean the population well, yes, Germany goes from, from 4 I million mean, to about 10 in, 12 you know yes in the year uh, in the year 1000 which is around the time of um henry the second the population is around 4 million and by the by 1200 so just before the reign of um frederick the uh, second stupermundi hohenstaufen uh we have a population around 12 million so yes a threefold increase in um 200 years which is um incredible and of course you know uh, the black plague will um the black death will um put an end to this and it's worth noting it's worth noting too that sort of beyond the the rhine danube frontiers of rome and sort of beyond anatolia and the fertile crescent you know what you might call the the center points of the classical civilizations this population growth in this part of the world would have been unheralded yeah it was point. unprecedented yeah it was nothing completely like unprecedented ever before Exactly, which, you know, we, we've spoken to some degree, like in some of the older stories, about the, the impetus of, of, you know, say, the um, the, the, the Kimbri and the Chitonis at the Ambrose migrating southwards, for instance. You know, this is this is even beyond that scale. So it's very significant economically um, in, a so, in a social context, in a military context. There's so many motivating forces here. Yes, and um, so moving on from this, we have, and again, I just want to leave this specific talk on the RC long to, to to the next slide, if that's possible. I just want to get the military history out of the way, because really, it's sure, yeah. the the Crusades facilitate the RC long. They create the conditions, and this is, you know, in terms of the military success, they don't create all these new German colonies. That's a process that occurs over the next hundred years. With the, you know, destruction of much of the power base of Niklot of the um, Obertrites, we have the, you know, dissipation of much of the local power of the the Peng of the pagan Vend, uh, Venden, the Vens in the um, the region between the Oder and the Elbe. And from there, we see the expansion into Pomerania and, you know, beyond that. So we have the expansion, of course, the Northern Crusades aren't just related to this area on the map as well. We also have the expand uh, the expansion of the Crusades into Finland, uh, which will involve, you know, most of the 13th century involving the Danes and the Swedes. And then we get back to the German-led Crusades, which are the Livonian Crusade. And just for reference on the top, um, uh, northeastern side of this map, we have modern day Latvia and we have modern day Estonia, Livonia roughly corresponding to um, modern day Latvia, although Coronia and um, uh, Letgala in the south weren't technically part of Livonia, just to make it even more complicated. Um, and it's, basically, it's basically half, um, half Latvia, half Estonia. <laughs> Yes. Um, in 1195, um, and again, it's important to note this region, again, pagan, uh, like, like, like the um, uh, the Vens, um, and again, surrounded on all sides by um, Christian powers. Really, the interest, you know, was well, which Christian power was going to dominate it, because of course, in the east, we have the Russians, the Russians who would take over this territory much later in the um, the 18th century. And of course, to the west, we have the, um, the Scandinavian powers. But now it's actually not neither of these powers, it's neither the Rus nor the the Scandinavians who take over Livonia, it is in fact the Germans. So in 1195, Celestine III proclaims a crusade against the Baltic heathens, and this time it's under the leadership of um, uh, the Bishop of Hanover, although he dies very quickly and is taken over by the um, by one Bishop Albert of um, uh, Boxhoveden. And um, over the next 30 years, we see the Christianization of Livonia, again, with a lot of imperial support, a lot of German and imperial recruits, in order to maintain a crusader presence in Livonia. Because again, you have the issues of many of these crusaders going to the Holy Land or going to um, the Baltic, having you know committed themselves to crusade, taken over this territory and then return home. 
home. It was one of the effects of the um, the first crusade. You know, hundred of thousand, hundred thousand crusaders come, and then there's a massive depopulation afterwards. Well, to avoid that yes. happening, in 1202 we have the creation of the Livonian Brothers of the Sword, a you know, permanent crusader garrison in this region. Whilst we oversee, you know, the aggrandizement of one of these new um, or seed long cities, the city of Riga, which is now the capital of Latvia. Riga, which will become, you know, like Magdeburg, a central um, point for conversion and Germanification of Livonia, and of course the Baltic Germans will, you know, live here until the until the 1940s. Really, um, this is, you know, establishing a, a, a nearly sort of millennia's uh, millennia's uh, sorry, um, uh, long presence of the um, of the Germans here, and this begins with the German Crusaders. What's also important to note is that the um, Livonians themselves, such as um, uh, Kalpo. Um, even assist with the Crusaders having converted against um, Livonian pagan rebels as well. So um, they actually are bring there, locals um, on board. Are, are, are there any cases of local um, 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 Slavic uh, lords or aristocrats in, in, inviting, inviting German settlers? Does that happen at all to your knowledge? Slavic ru rulers inviting German settlements. Yes, it happens with Poland, or rather, you know, it facilitates it in the same way they have the Jewish settlement as well in Poland, and it happens in Bohemia. Basically, the the, the reason why um, these you know settlers are allowed in is because they bring with them you know um, technical innovations from Germany yeah and right. they bas they basically set up trading um, trading posts I mean when it comes to you know cities in Poznan for example um, you know or uh, I can't think of another city off the top of my head I'll, I'll come to me later well, well we a large number of the a large number of the cities in um sort of northern and southern Silesia were founded by German communities throughout the 12th and 13th centuries for instance such as yes. Breslau and Opel and so on and so on Yes, um, when it comes to Silesia in particular, Silesia, of course, you know, very Slavic, which is going to become almost entirely um, Germanified, you know, towards the to, to, towards the, um, the the 18th century, etc. But we have, you know, German pockets in all, all throughout Poland as well, especially in Małopolska or southern Poland, uh, where we have a large German contingent in Krakow. But essentially, the Slavs, you know, the Wends would establish a local fortress, and then the German settlers would come out and they would establish, you know, a market town around it, essentially. Um, mm. So, it reminds yes. me of it reminds me of the Greeks, you know, with Nocratus in Egypt. You know, I mean, they go and they set up their little emporiums and what have you. Well, yes, it's very similar to the Greeks. I mean, consciously, you know, doing my research on this topic for this evening, um, I couldn't help but realize that this, you know, process of um, you know, cultural innovation, you know, uh, massive population expansion was very similar to what happened during the archaic period in Greece, Greek history. Indeed. And then we see the expansion of um, all of these um, Greek um, colonies throughout um, the Mediterranean basin. A very similar One, process happening here, although it's aided not, in, in, instead of that process, which was aided by um, Greek maritime dominance, here it is aided by the indeed. Crusades. Hmm. One might and say you, that the um, one might say that the uh, the Neapolis of the archaic period is uh, replaced by the medieval Neustadt. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. Um, Am you mentioned you mentioned there that you you of course had the influx of um of um German merchants and also Jewish merchants. Um, at this point, had the had the detestable trade in in in, in Slavic slaves, um, which which of course was facilitated um, by these crusades. Was it was was it dying down at this point? Because we're getting quite late, or or was it still still a, a major part of the economy? Did it happen? I'm going I'm going to confess that this is a subject which I I know very little. Again, my my main sort of area of expertise, such as they are, when it comes to the subject, retains the Southern Slavs. But um, in terms of I mean, this is just pure conjecture. I I really don't know enough about the um, the Prussian versus Lithuanian Crusades, but again, I can't imagine first because most of the Slavs you see here now are Christian. Um, I can't imagine there was much in the way of um, slavery, definitely against Christian populations. But I do definitely confess, Columba, that that is an area where I'm, I'm not an expert on. So I have to research more about that. But it's an interesting point you bring up, nevertheless. Mm. Uh, because I know that, of course, many of many um, Slavic slaves were taken and then sold in the south, right? Yeah. Exactly. Quite a lucrative trade. Yeah. Well, well, the thing is, if you consider, I won't keep on this too long, Aim. I know we need to move on, but just as a, as a reflection, just on that question of, of slavery, basically speaking, there's a couple of things to consider here, certainly from an economic standpoint. One, we've just, in the last sort of 10 or so minutes, reflected on the massive expansion of population at this point in time, even from before, you know, 1000 AD, even sort of leading up to that, but certainly from 1000 AD to sort of 12, 1300, we have this sort of fourfold increase, um, which is an unparalleled population growth in this region of Europe, in this sort of northern periphery of Europe at this point in time. And so if we consider the system of feudalism, I mean, even though 
the there's a reciprocal relationship between peasants and petty lords, for instance, right? And we have to appreciate there's only so many consumers in a given economic sphere at a given time. There's only so many crafts people that can perform crafts, and so many people who would have money to purchase um, product produce, whether it's primary produce or craft produce or or, or, or goods brought by merchants, etc. So, in the case of say the German states them bringing in a whole bunch of slaves would have been completely uneconomic. I mean, it isn't, say, like the Roman times where you had these vast um, sort of, um, you know, villa-based yeah. estates and, and, you know, large fields of wheat to be harvested. And, you yeah, know, and know. In, in, the case, in, in the case of the Roman system, like vast amounts of its landed gentry had been murdered in wars, you know. Um, and, and the other thing is, too, because uh, the slave trade was practiced, you know, south of the Mediterranean and there was this active demand for slavery, it would have been in their interest to basically have shipped them off down there because Europe. Yes, cause, yes, because I mean, I mean, people, people, people are already struggling for work as it is. That's a very good point. So if they were yeah, going to, right. to do this, then yeah, we, it would make sense to, to ship them off south, I suppose. Like, and of course, um, that quite, that quite that, that extreme that extreme pressure only ends with the Black Death, right? Where you get Correct. a complete reverse of the situation and the price of labor skyrockets and what happens. Ex uh, exactly, exactly right. Because in the end, if you're if you're a feudal lord and you have you know, a, a, a minor castle and you have, I don't know, 200 um, peasant families and they're t t tilling the land, then you purchasing 50 slaves to do half the work so that rather than your, your indentured servitude uh, servants working eight-hour days or working four-hour days, but you have to feed twice, tw twice as many mouths, literally makes no sense. Yeah, I mean, and, and, the, and, the, and the agricultural system... Um, in order to facilitate this increase, I mean, I mean, I'm not, an, I'm not an expert, but I know that it had been pretty much pushed to its limit. I mean, you had the, um, the, you, you know, the, the three field system, right, where you would, you and know, crop use one, you, yeah, you, yeah, crop rotation. You use one field to farm grain, another to farm, I don't know, beans or something, and then you'd leave yeah. one field fallow. And this, like, the idea was that it would regenerate. But, but, but even then, with the, um, right. with, with the, with the intensity of the agriculture that's going on and the size of the population, even this. Um, um, technique begins to begins to um, 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 not work. Hmm. Or oh, not so much doesn't work, but it certainly reaches its limits. Yes, it reaches a sort of limit. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not, it's it's not um, relatively speaking as productive as it had been. Correct. Right. Um. So, sorry. Sorry. Just um emphasize the chat. Unless I'm I'm making some sort of broad association with um the Baltic peoples and Slavs. No, that's not true. If I did make that assumption, I'm completely wrong. In terms of the demarcation of the Slavs, obviously the Vend the Venden were Slavs, the Pomeranians were Slavs, uh the Kubans in this region of Pomerelia uh were slavs however east of this region so roughly east of the vistula river um including i mean just in terms of the group we have the the old prussians we have the lithuanians we have the estonians we have the semigallians we have the coronians all of these groups all pagan all baltic um in terms mm. of their ethnicity and their language and their culture and this is where we begin again see the the most accelerated process of um german conquest in this region which is led by the um the teutonic order and just just for reference again these not being the same people as the the slavs of course as i mentioned the um the christians the poles set up their principality in the ninth century and from a thousand onwards the poles repeatedly try and conquer the baltic old prussians and they fail on all all attempts and in 1219 it is actually the polish it's the polish duke uh conrad the first of mazovia just for reference mazovia is the area around um, modern day warsaw you know the old capital of poland was of course mm. in krakow and moved to um to warsaw which is also the center of the cm which is the um uh the the princely parliament um in 1219 it is the Poles who initiate the Prussian Crusade with the approval of um, Pope Honorius III. You know, there's even you know the creation of a uh, bishop, um, a bishop of Prussia, Christian um, of Olivar, to organise this crusade. Um, nevertheless, you know it fails. Not only does it fail, but um, uh, Comrade Mazovia actually is subject to a counteroffensive, which takes over this um, area in the Chumno land along the Vistula, which um, which basically you know means that the crusaders are actually worse off than they were before the crusade you know to try and facilitate the migration of crusaders to the duchy of mazovia we have the creation of the order of dublin uh, basically the duke of mazovia's own crusader order but this again is unsuccessful so out of desperation uh, and due to this successful old prussian counteroffensive we have the um, plea by Comrade Mazovia to the um, Teutonic Knights to suppress the Prussians. Now, why the Teutonic Knights? Uh, just, just for a quick um, a bit of context and spirit. Uh, Christian of Oliver, 
the um, nominal head of the crusade was of course acquainted with um, Hermann von Salza, the um, the order head, and the order having been relatively recently created at this point. So we're talking this is twelve twelve, 12 um, this is twelve two six, and um, the order was created in eleven ninety in Accra during the Third Crusade, and of mm. course you know the Third to, Crusade. Um to to sort of protect pilgrims and what have you yes right. precisely in a similar function to the knights templar but it doesn't have nearly the same possessions as the knights templar which as we still discussed in our previous stream would come to be one of the um the greatest landowners and money lenders throughout all of europe right. um but um it's the it's this organization and um uh, the teutonic order which is set on as the organization to relieve the mazovian woes and um in addition to the plea from um uh, conrad uh, of mazovia we have Frederick II, Stupermundi Horn Stauffen, who gives his a, a specific imperial sanction that um, you can basically, the knights can basically conquer all of these areas in Prussia, including um, the areas which have been just recently taken over from Poland, namely the Charno land. And this is where we, you know, begin this hundreds of years conflict between the um, the Teutonic order and the Poles and later uh, the Poles and Lithuanians and the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth is over basically the the Duke of Mazovia Conrad believes that the Teutonic order is just going to be temporary to to basically push back the Prussians well of course it becomes permanent because when uh, von Salsa, you know, he basically believes that he's been given sanction by the emperor to carry out a full conquest, and he believes he's not subject to the Polish king or the Duke of Mazovia. He believes he's um, subject to no one apart from the Pope. And so from 1230 until 1203, the Teutonic Order methodically began attacking old Prussian territory, and they marked mm. their conquests through the construction of new cities, such as Marienburg and Königsberg. Um, Marienburg is featured on the left here, these very impressive so is this, um, red fortresses. Is this is. is this an example of medieval mission creep? Yeah. Uh, what, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, you know the the term mission creep, where say um, you know the, the term would be applied to say the Iraq War. You know, where we're we're going in to do this purpose, we're going in to do this, but of course, um, um, conditions conditions are such that the mission um, um, creeps out of its original uh, its original. Col brief, Col Col say. Columbia, a good example being, for instance, like oh, a no fly zone of visit Libya. Next minute, they're doing airstrikes on the capital. Kind of indeed, indeed, yeah, indeed. yeah, yeah. Exactly. It just seems to be an inevitable part of military operations. <laughs> they don't they don't want maybe, to stop having so much fun. Well, <laughs> maybe that was the maybe that was the interpretation uh, from John Mazovia, but um, it very much when it comes to Hermann von Salza, he believed right from the beginning his interest in the conflict was um, sated by the idea that this he basically believed that he'd been given a direct writ for massive expansion and he'd mm. been so, given it by the Poles and by the Emperor. Yeah. So this was very much him just going full Deus Wolf mode sort of <laughs> yes, I mean, in terms of uh, really going Deus Vault, I mean, um, not only does he establish <laughs> new, new cities, you know, creating these massive fortified cities, you know, unlike anything in the rest of the Osidlong, uh, these massive, um, you know, uh, defensive redoubts against the rebellious um, old Prussians. I mean, we're talking a crusade of, you know, over 20,000 crusaders, you know, with a, a core of Germans, a core of Saxons, you know, augmented by, you know, Danes and Poles and Pomeranians, etc., who, of course, will be betrayed, you know, by 12 or three the region has been you know subjugated has been divided into four bishoprics and under the nominal authority of the Archbishop of Riga um, after a um, after a military defeat uh, we have the um, of the Livonian order the Livonian order joins with the Teutonic order um, as I mentioned the um, the Knights of the Livonian brothers of the sword unite to form the state of the Teutonic order and so within a couple of decades um, this knightly order from its you know reduced mission from 1190 of um, protecting pilgrims to the Crusader routes has become one of the great powers of the Baltic Empire and as you can see on this map by 1260 um, all of the areas in orange I mean other than Livonia which it shares with the um, the temporal possessions of the Archbishop, the Archbishop of Riga, um, it you know it is a major military power, and it you will only grow from strength to strength. Mm, and yeah. like I said, and, and with does... um, th this castle building that you mentioned, I assume that these were skills that they learned in the in the Holy Land, which they brought with them. You know, I mean, of course, you have the famous Crusader castles all over the place. You know. Yes, but I think it's also important to note that these castles are sort of unique in their design as well. I mean, they're nothing like, say, for example, your um, your castles of Krakatu Chevalier or um, uh, mm. Kerak in the south. These are a, a new design of castle. And again, it's not just castle building. It is um, land reclamation from the marshes, because, of course, East Prussia was a notoriously sort of um, uh, undersettled area. Um, we have... Um, 
de mass deforestation as well. And we have massive, you know, um, German colonization. I mean, when it comes to the old Prussians, the old Prussians would routinely revolt against the um, Teutonic order. You know, some of them would convert and later they would begin to adopt, you know, German customs, German language. They would become involved in this, um, you know, this German city, this this German city culture, and um, they would become assimilated. But we still have old Prussians using their language and speaking, you know, yes. old Prussian up until the 18th century. In fact, there was even a um, during the Reformation an edition of the New Testament which was converted into Old Prussian. So, in terms of like a, mm -hmm. a like a, like a swift genocide of this region, I view it more as you know we see a, a rapid um, uh, subjugation, the creation of these massive fortresses to establish Teutonic order power in the area. As a fact we do see you know the, the killing of you know tens of thousands of prussians but most of them are subjugated through conversion and cultural you know uh, german um, cultural hegemony in the region so by the time we have the creation of the kingdom of prussia in 1701 the idea of prussian is now synonymous with german and old prussian is basically irrelevant indeed and, and it, you it, mentioned it's, it's um, the roman gold project all over again sort of thing you know in a way in terms of that synthesis Yes, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think once you get far away enough from the, um, I don't know, the centers of established civilization, as you call it, or, or, or as we might call it, that the, there is this, um, this synthesis that's required purely out of practicality. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, different locales, um, um, different ways of doing things are required, and you learn from the, you learn from the locals. I mean, one one fine example in in this area that I know about um, is, of course, the the Slavs built their houses. They built log houses. You know, where you take a log and put a log put, put a log on top of it and and keep doing that until you have a wall right very simple style of architecture um whereas the germans at the time um used timber you know where you, where you take a log you cut it into you cut it into you know um um, um cuboids you know log, um, um and of course it it saves wood it's a more efficient method um yeah. I, I, and, and you see these you see these two styles combine in this period around they the merge, yeah. yeah and you'll have um occasionally you'll have a house where um the bottom floor um will be logs and then the top floor will have a timber frame and so you do mm -hmm. see a, a synthesis on many different levels well, exactly and, and this is where you're sort of saying or what both people sort of saying about um uh the crusaders and their interactions with i mean both it has to be said both in different ways the saracens and the byzantines because both are capable of sophisticated construction in different ways and what's interesting is in this sort of time period, you know, where, where you could talk from, say, I don't know, uh, 1150 to, you know, the, almost the end of the medieval period, is whether it's um, Edward Longshanks' castle construction in, um, you know, in, in Britain with his, his campaigns against the Welsh and then later the Scots, um, whether it's uh, castles that were being built in Italy at this time, you know, and, and sort of the, the, the post-Crusade Norman construction of castles in, in Italy, um, whether it's, you know, Angevin castles in, in continental France or, or even, um, you know, Capetian castles. And indeed, construction here, they are adapted to the geography. They take this knowledge that they acquired from the East by the Crusades, from the Greeks and from the, from the Saracens. And wherever these Crusaders return or where they sort of undertake campaigns thereafter, they're adopting these construction engineering principles, but are adapting it to the local geographies. It's just something that for anyone who's interested in that thing, it's an interesting thing that they do. It's just intriguing to consider. Yes, those those, those, those pesky Germans, they're very crafty. <laughs> Yes, yeah, speaking about um, German peskiness and craftiness. So you mentioned Columba, the mission creep. I mean, basically, you know, from 1230 until 1290, we see the almost entire subjugation of the Baltic, with the exception of Lithuania, by the Teutonic Order. And of course, the Poles are horrified by the state of affairs. You know, they have um, invited, you know, the Germans in, the Crusaders in to deal with one enemy. And now they have created, you know, due, due to this invitation, a much more militaristic and much more you know terrifying enemy in the north which of course is now going to attack the christians i mean nominally from the 1260s onwards the order begins attacking the um the lithuanians but as you can see on this map the actual inroads to lithuania you know are very limited and in, in, if anything you know, the lithuanian the lithuanians will convert on their own by their own impetus um in the 14th century and then they will form an alliance with the poles to eventually evict the teutonic order so the the the, the actual the sole sort of um pagan um baltic remnant in Lithuania aren't conquered. In fact, the empire begins, or sorry, the order, the Teutonic order begins, you know, investing its interest towards, you know, Poland, um, the Polish domain. So looking at um, Pomerelia in the south, so the 
state of the order begins at the um, the River Vistula. Um, in 1308, um, nominally, the order is allied again with Poland because Brandenburg is wanting, under the Iskanians, is wanting to expand into the Pomerania region. This um, would later during the interwar period be known as the Polish Corridor. Um, the Teutonic order betray the Poles. They take over the city of Gdansk, then Danzig, um, and they will massacre the population of the city of roughly 10,000 people. And in terms of, again, I mentioned the fact that Teutonic order considered themselves to be subject to no one other than the Pope. The Pope himself in 1320 and in 1333 orders in favor of the Poles that these territories need to be returned to the Kingdom of Poland and the Teutonic order rather than you know, accepting uh, the, the, the authority of the papacy, which is this entire foundation. I mean, the terra marina, the area of the north, is basically considered like a, um, a vassal of the Pope. It has no other sort of authority. You know, it's led by the um, the figure in the form of the, the Archbishop of Riga, which, if anything, he becomes the, the single most sort of important religious figure, really, as a subject of the, um, of the influence of the Teutonic order. Um, the, the order is basically by the 14th century, it is at zenith, but it's basically rogue. It, um, it answers to no authority other than itself. And in terms of its original mission, which is to um, which was to convert the um, the territories, I mean, basically that had been achieved. And as I mentioned, Lithuania will convert on its own impetus. So we have this um, remarkable situation where Poland and Lithuania join to form the um, uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in opposition, you know, fully Christianized against the um, Teutonic order. And it's only with the Battle of Tannenberg at the beginning of the 15th century do we begin to see the order's authority waning until it comes to you know a complete collapse in 1466? Mm, indeed, and would you say that this um this situation of almost complete independence from the papacy and the church was due to this um this um I don't want to say barbarous but underdeveloped and and um and um perhaps less civilized nature of the area you know i mean there's not there's not the same lines of you know communication there's not it, there's not easy travel and what have you would you put it down to perhaps that? no perhaps that would have existed before the crusades but when we have the creation of the teutonic order as i mentioned this is a for lack of a better word it is a civilizing process it is the creation of these cities is the creation of this infrastructure a deforestation the creation of this you know this modern economic zone which will become intimately um connected with the hanseatic league in the west and so as a result of this, this becomes not just a, um, a monastic crusading power, not only a military power, but it becomes a principal economic power as well. And so taking control of cities like Danzig, controlling the mouth of the Vistula, cutting off Poland from any sort of economic input into the Baltic Sea is purely a strategic and economic consideration, not bound by any other spiritual consideration. So really what we're seeing is the creation of a independent economic empire in the Baltic Sea allied with the hands Hanseatic League, of course, which both the Hanseatic League and the Teutonic Order will also come to blows with um, the Kingdom of Denmark as well, repeatedly, mm. because of course Denmark controlled the Sound Toll, which connects the um, Baltic Sea with the North Sea at the same time. So I very much see this as um, temporal interests um, overriding the um, mm. spiritual interests of the empire. Pesky, the pesky state. Germans indeed. So before we move on, Marcus, um, you mentioned you had some extracts um, from two small paragraphs you wanted to read out. Um, would you want to get Give that a go before we go on to the Osidlum. Yeah, sure. It's um, it's only uh, it's about the the foundation of the um, of the of the order, and uh, well, there's actually a strange uh, a strange uh, thing I want to touch on, but I'll, I'll I'll get to it after I read the extract. But this is a this is a, the two paragraphs I want to read. In the year 1226, the Emperor Frederick II at the at his imperial city city of Rimini on the Adriatic coast of Italy issued an imperial edict or golden bull in favor of Hermann. Von Hermann von Salzer, master of the German crusading order, known to history as the, as the Teutonic Knights, investing in him the imperial prince, oh, investing him as an imperial prince for Kumaland, an ill-defined territory situated around Kulm or Kelmno near the river Vistula, in what is today's northern Poland. It reminds us that the em it reminds us that the empire, the highest secular authority in Western Christendom, had a genuinely international reach at this time. Frederick was in the throes of preparations for a crusade to Palestine, but at the same time was able to intervene in matters that would shape the history of Europe's Baltic hinterland for centuries to come. In the 1220s, Kelmno was an isolated uh, fortress of the Kingdom of Poland's marchlands bordering the Federation of Pagan Tribes, known collectively as the Prussians. The Order of German Knights of the Hospital of St. Mary of Jerusalem was the creation of a body of German knights who had started off as a field hospital 
organization during the Third Crusade. But soon, imitating as the Templars and Hospitallers, adopted a monastic vows. In 1199, Pope Innocent III officially recognized them as a military order of the church dedicated to the defense of Christian states in the Holy Land. And they soon extended their brief to the defense of endangered Christian territories on the frontier of Catholic Europe. The order had confirmed its military reputation in 10 years of fighting, 10 years of fighting for the King of Hungary against the, against the pagan Cumans in the Balkans. So he, that touches on Columbus' uh, thing, or, uh, his point on Mission Creek, firstly, and also it touches too on the um, the rapid, uh, you might say, um, oh, what's what I'm looking for? Uh, you know, the, the, their officialization, the fact that they were sort of felt backed by the temporal power of the Pope and also by the Emperor of Germany. Um, an interesting thing I wanted to touch on, the, the, the thing I opened my statement with, with was that the the bull is passed in Rimini, right? But the first crusade. Of Pope Urban is called, is called in Clermont Ferrand. It's quite interesting that sort of these events occur in particular cities all around Europe. There's sort of they're not done in Rome specifically, but there's sort of there's a more happenstance um, uh, take to where these pronouncements are made. Well, again, this shows the nature of um, localized imperial authority. I mean, there are of course some settled areas such as you know Paris, London, and when it comes to Frederick II, Palermo. But um, when it comes to, you know, centers of power and administration, really it's not until the late medieval period do we have a city associated with the administration. Prior to that, it is the temporal ruler, whether it be the Pope or yes, whether it be the, the Emperor. the person of the king, yes. Who is, which is, represents the capital. So, um, yes, thank you. Without further ado, we'll get on to all the things we've already sort of alluded to, which is just, the... Just, um, just very quickly, AM, just on, on that note about Rimini, just for people who might not know, because we obviously spoke about Venice, not last week, because I wasn't here, but the week before, we are talking about Venice. So Rimini was actually um, Imperial, the HRE's most important Adriatic port, because Venice at this time was still involved with the East Roman Empire, mm. just as a reference, yeah. Absolutely. So um, we've established the military aspects of German expansion and of German expansion eastward in particular. But note again how this was possible, not due to the direct influence of the emperor. And again, the emperor sanctioned the Teutonic order, but he wasn't actually partaking of the conquest himself. So it's really the decentralized nature of the empire and the crusades which enable this conquest, not the imperial dynasty, which is you know often in disinterested. I mean, talking about Frederick II in Rimini, um, Frederick II is principally concerned with establishing imperial hegemony in Italy. He's not concerned, and this is the same with um, Frederick II, Frederick I, Barbarossa. Um, they're yes, not concerned he, he, with um, his center is Sicily, right? He conceives of himself as a sort of um, southern southern emperor, I suppose. Italy's where yes. his heart is. Yes, of course. You know, um, Sicily being you know the heart of this um, imperial idea, going back to Roger the um, Second. Yes, and um, this idea of the emperors having any sort of vested interest in the expansion into what was basically considered a backward region, which was you know heavily urbanized and um, developed by by the Germans. You know really is this is remarkable because it is a decentralized process and this has been going on you know even before the what we see the nominal decentralization of the empire after frederick the second this is going on from the salian to the hohenstaufen dynasties and you know during this period in terms of like the cultural development we have the creation of you know more uh, German linguistic unity through the German high, la German high German language, but we also have the massive population increase, which we've already mentioned in Colombo, whereby from you know 1,000 to uh, 1,200, we see the population of Germany increase threefold from four to 12 million. And as you mentioned, you know this is partly as a result of the German war. But this is the medieval warm period, uh, technical technological innovation, agriculture, um, improved farming methods, and pivotally deforest deforestation. What is remarkable is that there isn't just an external colonization there is a inland colonization or the uh, uh, Landesabau, uh, which is responsible for, you know, taking down a lot of um, Germany's incredibly um, heavily forested regions. And of course, Germany yeah, I mean, that's something that's something that we should really hammer home. I mean, if you go back mm -hmm. to the, 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 the Roman period, say, and you read Caesar, Caesar, yeah. Caesar describes Germany as, as you know, um, um, the Hyrcanian forest, right, which is just covers covers germany as far as he knows you know just off into the distance it was just um this huge thick ancient forest that had been there since you know the, the paleolithic period and and today in germany it's pretty much been reduced to the the schwarzwald right the black forest that's the that's one of the few remnants of this incredibly thick forest you know but the, the, um it plays a deep role in the the German psyche. I mean, if you look at a lot of the German art in the Renaissance or or or, or slightly later in the 1500s, and, and the, you know, and there's, there's always this. Make reference to it. 
Yeah, definitely. You know, I mean, you know, there's always this tangled foliage and what have you. I mean, you even see it in the work of the Romantics, like you know, Caspar David Friedrich later and and what have you. But um, yeah, it played a big role in the in the German imagination, uh, and, and and this 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 deforestation effort was was truly massive. You know, I have to say, I love the fact that the Germans have a specific term for it. You know, like we're settling inwards, and there's and then there's a word for it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. indeed. <laughs> Yes, and um, again, what's also important to mention is that this isn't just an exclusive, um, exclusively German phenomena, as this is the warm period that affects you know, the entire sort of um, a, a European civilization at this point. We see Wallonian, Dutch, Danish, even um, Scottish. Um, yes, I was going to mention as well. There are, there are some enterprising Scots who come all the way. In many ways, it reminds me, and we, we talked about this briefly before we came on, in many ways, it reminds one of the situation in the in the you know the colonial period of the 1800s or or or, or the situation in America you know with the west where where people are just clamoring to get out there and, and claim about claim about of this this land that's that has suddenly become available you know word, word spreads all over Europe a uh, frontiersman culture you might call it indeed indeed uh, I, I, and um different peoples are are called on for for different skills i mean am you mentioned the um the land reclamation that goes on. And um, this is really only possible because um, loads of um, um, Walloons and, and Dutchmen are invited, you know, and, mm. and of course they, they, they're, they're experts in this, in this field, you know, creating polders and what have you. Um, um, and, and not only is this, you know, I mean, it provides new land, but I mean, I mean, when, when the Dutch do it, they, they do it really well and, and the land becomes um, remarkably productive. I mean, you know, if you look at the Netherlands, today i mean it's still one of the largest agricultural exporters in the entire world which is you know ludicrous but i mean i mean you know they, they, they've always had this strong expertise because of course they're constantly assailed by floods and what have you and so um their expertise was was, was drawn on in a big way especially in the um in the baltic region which you discussed absolutely and that, that's really important to discuss again the germans may be provide the bulk of the actual sort of manpower in terms of the colonization they may provide the legal system but again it's expertise throughout all of europe which is resulting in this um colonization development of the um of the east or slavica uh, with the exception of course baltica um so yes uh, i mean just in terms of like the effect of de deforestation in particular take silesia for example from 1200 to 1300 um deforestation resulted in something like a sevenfold increase in the availability of arable land which is you know incredible when you're thinking about just just the scale of the population increase and how you have to create these large um subsistence because again agriculture is the bedrock of um, medieval society this is um pre-industrialization so the availability of land is essential if you're going to grow you know vast um uh, you know civilizations with vast populations but um one you know, principal feature of this of course is the development of the creation of towns which is you know a, a crucial aspect of the osceola it's these urban centers you know often um as i already mentioned you know the settlers would arrive at a pre-existing Vendish stronghold or you know what's known in Slavic as Grat and they would construct not only trading settlements but you know manufacturing settlements as well these um is that, centers um, of um so sorry to interrupt but you mentioned that word Grad there is that where you know say um Leningrad comes Petrograd, from Petrograd yes same? yes Indeed. yes it is okay, the same word, same route and um just, you know just on the deforestation if I may quickly I am sure um one thing to take one thing to keep in mind also um oh, sorry I'm going to sound like a complete a bumpkin here, but one thing to do on <laughs> keep in mind with with agriculture and, and the farming aspect of thing is that um, Colombo was saying that you're talking about one of the most heavily forested areas of, of Europe, um, and these and these forests are old. These are these are sort of Paleolithic era um, old growth forests with um, you know very very dense old wood in them, and when you when you clear them, one of the primary methods of doing this in medieval ages they would do a uh, perform a process called cut and burn. So they would log these mm. trees and, mm. you know, craft people, whether it was, you know, furniture makers or castle builders or whatever, they would obviously on sell timber. You know, merchants would sell timber in the local markets or they would be exported elsewhere, whatever. But there's there's obviously a good proportion of the tree which is unfit for that process. So they would pile branches, bark, um, tree stumps, whatever, into piles and literally burn them into ash. And, and what you do in that process is you're um, – you're you're petrifying the wood and you're carbonizing it and then what happens with that wood is it goes into the soil and it increases carbon content and for anyone with a modicum of interest in, in, in growing things it doesn't matter if it's wheat or, or, or carrots it doesn't matter um you're going to get the full <laughs> carrot <laughs> um, but but uh, carbon content along with nitrogen are two of the most important elements of of growing healthy 
of, of growing healthy produce of any kind, of any edible human produce. And, um, and, and especially in Germany, if you're talking about the, the sheer density and the sheer age of these, of these forests and the scale of this disfor- mm. deforestation, you're, talk- you're having a massive, massive, um, uh, essentially an injection of, of fresh carbon into these soils. Mm. Which would the soil becomes the- exceptionally in- rich, in- yeah. Immensely productive. And I mean, I don't know if, anyone, if many people here are from Germany or have traveled to Germany. I luckily have. And I mean, I've traveled, I've, I've driven literally the width of, of Bavaria and uh, and Fra- and Franken, Frankia, and um, all the soil in Germany is already rich. It is black, dark loam, which is already nutrient dense. So when you're when you're placing that much carbon into that soil, you're making it hugely productive. And I say that because we talk about we talk about the the, the population increase in this time. These things happen in conjunction with each other. It's not happenstance. And this also occurs with increase in technology. You have developments of the plough. You have developments of, of the water wheel. You have developments of crop rotation, like you mentioned, Columbo. All these things are happening in conjunction, which are facilitating this monumental population growth, which itself is probably acting as an impetus for the for what the Germans call the Drang nach Osten, the, the drive east. Mm. And also, and also the um, and also the increasing state complexity, right? I mean, the more people you have, the more systems need to be set up, and what have you. Yes, quite. Yes. Sorry, AM. That's my agricultural tangent. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's it's very interesting. I think it's vital to understanding this region, as as you're no doubt aware. I'm, I'm much more, you know, when it comes to my historical expertise, such as they are, you know, I much more focus on the the politics and the big picture and basically kind of like the the ed wood of history if anyone um has any sort of knowledge of um, plan nine of outer space you know it's not about the tiny details it's about the big picture so um <laughs> so um the three, the three was working wonderful symbiosis absolutely so, um, so, so, I, so i appreciate all these um detailed explanations regarding agriculture which again is crucial to understanding the um what you can say is the in- incredible sort of um again rich um intellectual atmosphere in terms of just the innovation the progress during this medieval time uh, rather than these again completely mentally stunted backwards people which again is the the post enlightenment view of this period we always have i think it's very important to dispel that um view whenever we have occasion to um yes, so, yes the, 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 the endless sneering of intellectuals amongst little people it's never never been different yes and i was going to say that that enterprising attitude um of course was a big impetus for some of the legal developments in this time which were huge yes and well. this this gets on to um to the big point so um i mean the germans were you know establishing towns around original strongholds they were establishing you know uh, towns around old bishop Forks, as you mentioned columbia you know uh, the bishop Forks, the diocese being you know the center of christian um administration such as havelburg um you would create entirely new cities such as um griswald in uh, pomerania and you know often cities these cities would be you know designed according to a geometrical plan and all of them would intersect at the central market and again that should emphasize how important trade and you know these were hubs of trade and again the expansion of the Hanseatic League all these leagues founded on the idea of mutual self-defense and um, regula- uh, re- um, regulating trade throughout um, all, all of this you know, vast region of the North Sea and the Baltic I mean and again this is owing to the decentralized manner of the expansion many of these new towns automatically became free towns and this is where we have German town law and German town law draws its inspiration from you know town privileges which were established from the Magdeburg rights during the reign of Otto the Great. Otto the Great, of course, established these rights in Magdeburg for the purpose of creating the impetus for colonization into this region. And of course, as we discussed, that failed. That first attempt failed. But the legal precedent for these rights was there, established with Otto the Great. And it becomes the basis for founding these new towns. And they are basically these towns are created and it bestows upon the denizens um property rights and it creates you know a local jurisdiction from the town the idea that these ordinary denizens are not going to be subject to any higher authority which you know for the medieval mindset is you know really quite a um you could say a political revolution in addition to um you know an economic and a social revolution going and on again especially in, in um this period where things have become so overpopulated and stayed you know i mean there was almost no opportunity i mean i mean to have to have something like this come along it was just a a, a wonderful chance and people People jumped at it, you know. Absolutely, it's, I think it's, it's also it's, sorry, Marcus. It's, it, no, I was going to say it's almost the you might say the origin point of the the German sort of socio-economic um, idea of Mittelstand. If you're familiar with that, AM, I don't know if you've heard of the term, but um, what they call Mitt- Mittelstand, which is kind of like a symbiosis between an economic and a a um, political sovereignty of, of either a town or a regional area based around the yes. town. Yes, absolutely. Um, and just in regards to this pitch, if I may very quickly, because you touched on a good point, 
if you look at this image on the left hand side one thing to notice about all these settlements and towns or not all of them the majority of them they're either based along rivers which is for trade purposes and especially in this time before the advent of railroads moving things along the sea lanes along barges and, and small ships small boats is a lot faster than by land and also the, the, and also rivers are a, a secondary source of food in terms of um, freshwater fish etc and another thing to consider is where they're not surrounded uh, where they're not straddling a, a waterway or an ocean or the sea or, or, or a river they're on the boundaries of forests and what lies in forests? Yeah, so I was going to make you that have, point. You have you have wild animals. You have you have rabbits. And you have deer, and you have meat and skins and pelts. So these are economic areas, or, or perhaps even to a degree, a, 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 they have obviously military purpose as well. But there's a military, a, a, a joint economic and military purpose of the foundations of these towns, and they're very logically placed, which is worth taking note. Yes. I mean, I imagine it would also be quite dangerous to just go and set up a little town in the middle of the woods somewhere. I mean, there could be, you know, bandits and what have you. I mean, you know, it's much harder to um to have, you know, law and order. Uh, it would be a more dangerous and precarious and, and, prospect. And just, I mean, and just to get to and from as well, like it's not easy walking through an old forest, that's an old Paleolithic forest, you know. Indeed. I mean, where the exception to that rule would lie, I mean, obviously we have the expansion into Bohemia as well, is that when a town is cropping up around a particular resource, so you have lots of mining towns in Bohemia in particular as yes, well. Yes, yeah. um, that's true, of course, yes. So just again, uh, mentioning from the uh, extension of the German town law, I think it must be also important to notion that there's minor variances in individual law, and this you know associates with some particular aspect of expansion. So we have Lübeck law, which is the model for some hundred cities, but it's not analogous with the Merchant League. However, it just so happens that the capital of the Hanseatic League is in the city of Lübe uh, Lübeck, which again was um, created as a result of the, um, you could say, the first city to be conquered, uh, uh, to be created out of the Ossidlong in 1140. And um, the League, I mean, extended this legal code to govern the import of goods, the regulation of goods, the regulation of armies for mutual self-defense being incredibly important. And by the 1300, the Hanseatic League was, you know, one of the most um, important political organizations in Europe, although, you know, it would never evolve to such a thing like Venice, where you have a principal uh, center of political power, and then you have a Stato de Mao, you have the Terra Firma, you have the, you know, the state of the sea and the dependencies. Rather, this is always a loose confederation of city-states operating around a, a, a similar legal code, you know, organizing for mutual self-defense, though collectively they can exercise this massive commercial power, which they will throughout the, um, the 14th and the early 15th centuries. And um, as I mentioned, you know, m many of the um, uh, I mean, for example, you had, um, uh, what was it, you know, Brandenburg law applies to the um, the cities of the Teutonic order, Nuremberg law applies for the German settlements in Bohemia, etc. So all of these tiny little variances setting up all these tiny little towns, and you see on this map, I mean, we're talking, you know, massive rate of expansion, we're talking German expansion into um, Slovenia, Bohemia, Silesia, Pomerania, Prussia, Livonia, Estonia, Poland, Hungary, but you see know, not even mentioned on this map, but we have the first um, uh, German colonization of Transylvania as well during this period at the same time. And then we'll have, you know, during the um, the 18th century, we'll have later, you know, Volga German expansion and we'll have um, Danubian expansion and the the so-called um, uh, you know, Swabian Turkey, etc. Um, all of these um, processes happened at, you know, roughly around the same time during the um, the 14th century. And in terms of assimilation, you know, a lot of these um, organizations, you know, the Germans will become the dominant culture. However, in areas, as you mentioned, Columba, where they were basically invited, such as in Poland, um, across a period of hundreds and hundreds of years, the Poles, you know, would assimilate the Germans, not vice versa. Where in Bohemia, um, you would have a large contingent of Germans, you know, by the 18th century, roughly a third German, um, two thirds Czech, which will lead to, you know, major problems down with the nationality crisis. So it's not a universal phase of German expansion and assimilation. There are local nuances to this. So, for example, as I mentioned, the Sorbians in Lusatia, which is right in the heart of this map, ironically um don't get assimilated in fact assimilate many of the germans in the region and um so yes i mean what you know causes the end of this is obviously for my um point of view it's you know um geographic factors and um the factors of the plague um the black plague hits in um 1346 1347 you know arriving from the uh, the golden horde arriving through the genoese colonies in um the crimea and um it results in the decimation of the european population rush you know roughly about 
third of the population of Europe dies. And also we have the beginning of the Little Ice Age period, the end of the warm period as well. And this, you know, abruptly stops the impetus for colonization, which, you know, had created this um, unique situation in um, uh, Europe. This, again, you can say an organic situation brought on by all of these events, all of these factors working in tandem. But now I think, you know, this, this goes on from whilst we have this massive decentralization of political authority coinciding with a massive expansion of German civilization and, um, you know, territorial settlement um, within the empire itself, we're seeing this massive um, internal decentralization. And so this effect that we see in the Osiedlung with the creation of the um, the free cities, although nominally under the authority of the empire, is going to be a feature we see to somewhat replicated with the empire itself, where the emperor, emperor's authority towards the end of this period will become nominal. And this is getting to the um, first great interregnum. So quick reference to people who, you know, have forgotten or haven't watched um, episode six and um, episode five, by 1250, the House of Hohenstaufen, which produced Frederick II, Stupermundi, you know, um, the King of Sicily, who had you know, waged a 20-year war with the Pope for control over Italy, dies. And his sons, um, Manfred and um, Conrad, and his grandson, Conradin, uh, die. In the case of Conradin, he is actually physically executed. And with that, we have the destruction of the um, Duchy of Swabia, which had been, you know, the central power of the Hohenstaufens in Germany. And it becomes, as a result of this, from 1268 onwards, one of the most um, decentralized regions in Germany. And just to, you know, illustrate the absolute evaporation of imperial authority in this aftermath, you know, which had already been declining owing I mean, to the fact that um, Frederick II decided to move his power base from Germany you know, the Salians, of course, operated in the city of Worms in Franconia. The Hohenstaufens moved to Palermo, which is, you know, is one of the most far removed places in Europe you can have to rule over Germany. And you know, Frederick II had very little in terms of interest in German affairs. Um, the Electoral College um, gets, basically gets established during this point, and it's created, or rather it's, um, you can say it's ratified by something known as the um, the immemorial custom of Urban IV, whereby you have in 1257, the election of two German kings concurrently. So, and um, the German kings who are elected are, if I remember correctly, um, one is um, Richard, the son of um, King John of England, and the other is Alfonso X, the, um, the King of Castile. And um, in terms of like, what were the prince electors? The prince electors were basically now had the legitimacy to appoint and even in some cases depose an emperor at will. And in many cases, they would build up these um, massive um, temporal dynastic possessions that would act as um, independent power brokers within their own right. And they would simply just grow during this period. So we have the Archbishop of, um, Main, of Mainz, of Trier and Cologne. And just to, again, to emphasize that um, Mainz in particular had been, you know, periodically the center of imperial administration and often the um, Archbishop of Mainz would be the Imperial Chancellor. So very appropriate for him to have this dignity as Prince Elector. When it comes to the other electors, the secular electors, we have the King of Bohemia, the um, the Count Palatine on the Rhine, and Saxony. And originally it was um, the Duke of Swabia, i.e. the Hohenstaufens, but of course the Duchy of um, Swabia collapses in 1268, and this is quickly replaced with the um, Margrave of Brandenburg. So we have these um, seven established powers that would you know, come to dominate the empire. And um, with the exception of um, Bohemia, which will, you know, uh, achieve its own electoral dignity in the 17th century, um, it will remain constant up until the um, dissolution of the empire with um, Napoleon at the beginning of the um, 19th mm. century. And is there not also in this period, because of this um, this severe lack of decentralization, of course, you mentioned um, um, Richard and Alfonso. I mean, I mean the the other the other powers of Europe are all trying to um, um, get their man on the imperial throne, right? The French, particularly. Yes. Well, I'll just sort of um, go into that. So there had been a anti-king, of course, set up by the Pope in opposition and the Guelph faction in opposition to Frederick II, William of Holland. He dies very quickly, and in 1257, you have this election involving these um, electors were then ratified through the um, immemorial custom. And they are both foreigners, you know, John, John of England, um, you know, his son, Richard, you know, John is already, you know, severely reduced in his position, thanks to the wars. Yes. Of, um, John Philip is having II. some problems. <laughs> yes, Philip II, Augustus. Um, so Richard, you know, he barely even visits the empire. And this, uh, with, with, with his election, you know, the title basically becomes nominal. He's basically the stand in for the pro Guelph faction. And without Fonson, the Temple of Castile, of course, the, the King of Castile, the dominant kingdom in Spain at this point, um, he never visits the empire at all. 
So this this entire notion of there even being an imperial authority is purely nominal from um, twelve fifty six up until twelve um, seventy three. It, it, so it's more just a sort of um, a sort of constitutional requirement, a sort of figurehead. That in a way. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Oh, well, yes, for the dignity of our factions and this constant feud, the Gelfs and the Ghibellines will produce two people, you know, who aren't even going to visit, you know, we're just going to fight among ourselves, why we have Excellent. absentee, two, uh, two uh, you know, double absentee kings. And this is where we get to the most, one of the most interesting parts of this discussion, which is this figure on the left, um, Rudolf, which is um, the origin of the Habsburgs. And um, just to again, I want to give an introduction to these main principal political houses which are going to dominate this period. So the name Habsburg originates with the um, Council of Kletgal, which is in Argau in um, Switzerland in the north here. You can see the little pink possessions in this map here. And um, in terms of like the dignity of this house, I mean the Habsburgs were just these minor pro um counts with virtually no authority whatsoever, and it's only as a result of the evaporation. Of authority beginning with Frederick II and the constant wars with the Gelf factions, that um, Rudolf becomes a person of note. Rudolf having inherited the county in um, 1239. Um, because of his you know, ardent loyalty to the Hohenstaufens, he's routinely invested with more and more territory in Germany. Again, emphasize the fact that Frederick II has very little interest in Germany, so he's more than willing to cede up territory which will be utilized by an effective vassal, i.e., Rudolf um, von Habsburg. Yeah, so in the meantime, he's busy trying to, you know, find out the natural language, <laughs> you know, and bizarre experiments and what have you. But, but yeah. goodness me, he actually had a long life. I didn't realize King Rudolph lived quite so long. But for yes, he years, was quite a, an elderly yes. statesman. Yes, he was 55 when he was elected, which is um, quite an accomplishment, and especially considering his accomplishments and his um, relatively short reign at such an old age, and again, considering his um, achievements at the Battle of Marshfeld. So just mm. to give an int introduction. Um, so really, in the demise of the House of Hohenstaufen, we have the creation of the Habsburg power base in this um, these few little domains in Swabia and um, North Sicily. And um, why is he elected? Well, this is where we get you know the beginning of um, successful high Habsburg dynastic politics. Um, he basically becomes, you know, elected King of the Romans in 1273 uh, due to the diplomatic marriage, whereby he marries two of his daughters, one to the Duke of Saxony, one to the Elector Palatine. And um, in terms of the opposition, because, you know, the Guelph and the Ghibline factions have been so utterly decimated and um, the two contenders to the imperial throne who actually have any sort of blood link to the Hohenstaufen family are basically, they, they commit to um, supporting the candidacy of Rudolf. Interestingly enough, the main opposition comes from Ottokar II of Bohemia, who is one of the you know greatest um, Bohemian kings during this period, who has just conquered um, Austria. And this is where we get into the creation of what we now understand as the, the modern House of Habsburg and their, their original sort of um, royal domains. Um, again, in terms of the diplomatic skills of Rudolf, he brings the Pope on board. You know, again, the Pope's having been the constant bane of the um, of the Gelf, of the Ghibelline faction, of course, you know, Rudolf was a member of the Ghibelline faction by ceding all claims to southern Italy and committing to a new crusade. And again, Rudolf has no vested interest in Italy at this point. His power base is entirely in um, Swabia and Germany. So um, again, it makes complete sense for him to make this, um, you can say, diplomatic concession to the Pope, albeit in terms of power politics, it's meaningless. You know, he's such a, it's such a weak position that he barely has the ability to exercise any authority in Germany, let alone over the entire empire proper, which includes you, um, um, most of Italy. Would you say that this, um, this division, which you speak of between, you know, Rudolf and, um, and um, what was his name? The, the one who conquered Austria, sorry? Ottokar. Ottokar, um, would you say that this um, this division, um, in some way, perhaps um, sows the seeds of the, um, the the religious division between Austria and, and Germany that we that we see in the the modern world the past few centuries? Um, do, you, do you see a seed of that there? Uh, well, well, not really, because um, well, that, that's sort of getting way, way further down the line. I, mm. I think, I think what's also important to note is that the the religious opposition really begins in Bohemia, less less in Germany proper, and of course Saxony in the north. And they, again, I don't want to really go down the line because that's, that's way too complicated the question and <laughs> okay. um, too tangential. But um, yes, Ottokar the second of Bohemia. Again, interestingly, the the Austrians have been ruled by a house known as the House of Babenburg, and um, Ottokar had overthrown the last um, sovereign duke of Babenburg in Austria, nominally because his wife was also a Babenburg, Ottokar II's wife. And so 
basically through military conquest, using this incredibly flimsy pretext. He had taken over not just Austria, but Styria, Calentia. And again, most of these regions we now consider as part of Italy and Slovenia as well. But Austria used to be much bigger if we take in the entire um, dynastic inheritance, which you know includes areas like um, Tyrol and modern-day Slovenia. Mm -hmm. um, but because of this you know, shaky contention and the fact that Ottokar has imperial ambitions, um, Rudolf now has a pretext to attack him. And so um, he inflicts the imperial ban. And just for reference, the imperial ban is basically like a, a condemnation whereby you are an outlaw. So, you know, basically you could be hunted down and you could be... Um, Anyone can lay hands on you. Yeah. Anyone can lay hands on you. And um, Ottokar, um, again, in, in fairness to... Um, Rudolf. Rudolf is able to expertly isolate Ottokar from potential allies in Bohemia and Hungary, um, leaving him, you know, alone when um, Rudolf marches, marches to defeat him at the Battle of um, Marchfeld in 1278. And as a result of the Battle of Marchfeld, you know, the Bohemians are defeated. They lose their temporary conquest in um, Austria. And the Habsburgs, for the first time, now replacing the Babenberg dynasty, have established a dynastic inheritance over Austria, which will last all the way up until 19, um, 1918, 1919. And um, from here, rather than focus on you know, achieving peace in the empire, Rudolf commits himself to stabilizing his succession over this you know, vast conquest of territory from this tiny little area in Switzerland, which he, um, he had immediately inherited. So you know, he was able to achieve that. He was able to achieve an effective power base, which to you know, wage his um, later imperial ambitions. But in terms of actually becoming an effective emperor, um, he was completely outmaneuvered by the fact that um, you know, he was very old at this time. And again, even with Austria, you know, he still had limited resources to be able to bring about the restoration of you know any sort of authority to the kingdom of germany and empire of course he was never crowned either so he died in um when was it 1291 having been uncrowned and this is again should emphasize how much damage had already been done because the um electors of germany had appointed um rudolf essentially because he was more or less powerless and he had bought off that position but from here they begin a hundred years practice of refusing to allow any sort of dynastic succession so Albert is the obvious, um, the son of uh, Rudolf is the obvious contender to be the next um, king of the Romans and potentially Holy Roman Emperor if he ever ventures into Rome and gets crowned. Just because ki king of the Romans is a sort of um, the title that you would give to the, the 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 man who's sort of marked out for the for the yes for the, yes precisely the the, right? the yeah. idea is that um, the electors of Germany the princes of Germany have the authority to raise a king of Germany or the king of the Romans but they don't have the authority to raise an emperor that mm. power alone relies on the Pope so again that, that, that's why um, that's why Napoleon gave his son that title right. King of, King of Rome. Rome. Yeah. Yes, it, it was an ode to that in addition to so much, you know, Napoleon's LARPing, but <laughs> not without getting into that. <laughs> um, so, but, but again, this is this is interesting because Adolf of Nassau, who is essentially a non-entity, is elected to frustrate this idea of um, dynastic succession and proving how art artificial this is. Adolf of Nassau is in turn deposed and succeeded by Albert von Habsburg, the son of Rudolf. And this is where we get the French interest, which you were talking about, Columba, yes. which is um, Philip IV is you know, basically desperate to, you know, I mean, oh, basically is this French... with Charles of Valois. Yes, yes. yes. French, power, French power had, you know, skyrocketed during the reign of um, Saint Louis and Louis IX, uh, Philip III and Philip IV. And as we can see, even with Rudolf securing um, Austria for the Habsburgs, imperial authority was an, at an all time low. And so Philip IV, as an extension of France's authority, wanted to put a puppet Holy Roman Emperor on the throne and this begins a conflict between um Al albert von habsburg and philip iv um albert of course finds an ally in bonifaci the eighth who will basically be murdered indirectly by um philip the fourth a bit later on and um i mean albert is desperate to try and you know, hold on to the imperial territory in the west you know prevent it falling into french hands so he tries unsuccessfully to take over holland and zealand he tries to place his son on bohemia but he's ejected you know within a year he tries to um acquire uh Turingen or thuringia uh west of saxony and again this is idea of you know like the french kings we were talking about like um louis the sixth and louis the seventh it's this idea of um you know, eliminating tolls and getting rid of the um, the robber barons, etc., and getting rid of these um, tyrannical practices in the absence of any sort of um, overarching authority. And nevertheless, this causes basically 
Albert to receive the enmity of virtually everyone, including his own family. And he's actually murdered by his um, own nephew, John von Habsburg of Swabia. And this ends the, you could say, the first period of Habsburg ascendancy, whereby the Habsburgs try and set up an imperial dynasty. You know, this fails. This first attempt fails, and it'll take um, over a hundred years before they have another successful attempt. And this um, gets onto the figure on the right here which is the second um, main sort of family during this period, which is the um, the House of Luxembourg. Now, Henry III is elected as king. And um, again, you know, where did he come from? Well, Henry, as the Count of Luxembourg, had basically submitted himself as a French vassal. Again, you know, sh showing the, the power of the front French influence at this time that Luxembourg was nominally part of the Holy Roman Empire, but they had voluntarily subjugated themselves to the authority of um, Philip IV and the King of the French. And this is where we get Philip IV's big push to Charles de Valois on the um, imperial throne. And for various obvious reasons, the electors are terrified by this prospect of having, you know, basically complete French domination in the empire. So they and settle not only on this- French domination, but the domination of Philip IV, which is yes. quite, quite a prospect in and of itself. Yes, yes. Link, link here to um, our previous discussion on the House of Capet, if you want to um, hear about the- um, Exploits. Yeah, the exploits and the absolutist tendencies of um, Philip IV. Um, but nevertheless, this is unsuccessful. And so, you know, basically, Henry III is one of the ideal compromise candidates because he's nominally um, affiliated with the French, yet he has no connection to the Guelph or the Ghibelline factions either. So the idea is that this non-entity could be hoisted on the throne and, um, you know, basically we can control him. And of course, it turns out that Henry III is actually one of the most um, energetic and ambitious emperors, you know, since um, Frederick II, uh, very cleverly. Um, he, you know, realizes that the Habsburgs need to be contained because they are obviously the principal threat. They've already dethroned um, one emperor who was elected. So rather than, um, you know, let Bohemia go to waste, you know, the Habsburgs have tried to install their own king on Bohemia. Henry successfully installs his son, John the Blind, who will die at the Battle of Cressy during the Hundred Years' War, as um, king of Bohemia to succeed from the um, premised dynasty through matrilineal descent through um, Wenceslaus II. And um, so, so again, this is all buttressing this idea that the, the empire has to have some sort of authority, the emperor has to have some sort of power base if the empire is going to survive the um, the influence of Philip IV. Yeah, otherwise doesn't it's die just until, until, right? You yes, he doesn't to die. You need men. Yes, he doesn't, absolutely. He doesn't die until 1314. So um, Philip, realizing his... Um, very weak, you know, claim on the throne, despite the fact he's a very minor noble. And, you know, despite the fact he's just taken over Bohemia, he resolves that he's going to go to Italy. He's not only going to be crowned emperor, but he's going to restore imperial authority in Italy at the same time. And he embarks on this um, campaign to um, resurrect the Ghibelline cause in Italy, which is remarkable considering how Frederick II had, you know, tried and failed ultimately in the end so spectacularly. And um, again, this was facilitated by the fact that the papacy is very weak. The Pope is now um, in his Babylonian captivity in Avignon. Yes, this is the Avignon and, papacy, yes. And, um, and, and, you know, and, and also just on the Italian thing too, never mind, it frustrated arguably the greatest of the uh, German emperors too. I mean, Barbarossa was, um, was a, uh, humbled in Italy as well. Yes, by it's the Lombard a, League, yeah. It's, it's not been a, a, a thriving hunting ground for, for German emperors in the last century and a half. Absolutely. But um, this, this is interesting, nevertheless, because um, Henry tries and he successfully, you know, wages a, a brief war against the Neapolitans and the, the Florentines, so much so that he um, earns the praise of Dante, who is basically considered, you know, the, the greatest imperial reformer of Italy who never was, because whilst he temporarily revives the um, Ghibelline cause in Italy, he dies very suddenly at the age of 40 in 1313. So after just a year from being crowned, he dies. And after that, after all that expectation, all of the imperial hopes are just thrown into complete chaos again. Um, however, his again, his um, the ascendancy of the House of Luxembourg it, it will endure. It's not just um, a temporary reign like um, uh, like that of um, Adolf of Nassau, because John, as I said, John the Blind had been placed on the throne of Bohemia. So the Luxembourg has Luxembourg now has a power base beyond ti the tiny county of Luxembourg with which to wage ultimately successful new imperial acquisitions. But this is where we get to the the third major dynasty in this um, this discussion of the rivalry, which is the the House of Wittelsbach. So in thirteen. 14, two rival kings are elected again, two um, doppel kings, Louis IV, the Bavarian, Frederick um, the Handsome von Habsburg, 
And where does the House of Wittelsbach come from? Well, the House of Wittelsbach, like the House of Habsburg, is one of the um, most you know, distinguished of all the um, dynasties along with the House of Wealth, which later becomes the House of Hanover, and the House of Wettin, which later becomes the, um, the Royal House of Saxony. Um, it begins around very similar time to the House of Habsburg. So they begin as um sorry, sorry to interrupt, I am. Is that to say that the, the house of the, the Welfs or the Guelphs break up into basically two cadet branches? Is that sort of how that works? Yes, the house, I mean the greatest um exponent of Welf power is of course Henry the Lion. And he this of is course. this this actually plays into the, the rise of the House of Wittelsbach, because the Wittelsbach and of course the house the House of Wealth ruled Bavaria, kind of like the House of Babenberg ruled um, Austria before the mm -hmm. House of Wittelsbach. So um, the House of Wittelsbach starts off as, um, they start off as the um, the Council of uh, Cheyenne, which is, you know, uh, right in the middle of um, Bavaria uh, during the 11th century, kind of as, um, you know, the Habsburgs begin as the Council of Tetgau, and later, later they begin to adopt their castle as their royal dignity. So the Counts of Kletgau become the Counts of Habsburg and the Counts of um, uh, Cheyenne become the Counts of uh, Wittelsbach. And during the 12th century in 1180, a Wittelsbach is proclaimed as Duke of Bavaria due to um, Henry the Lion's defeat at the you know hands of the um, the Hohenstaufens at the hand of, hand of Frederick the Second, sorry Frederick the First Barbarossa, and um, from the defeat of the House of Welf in Bavaria, we have the rise of the House of Wittelsbach. And from 1180, the Bavarians would you know despite the duchy fragmenting, reuniting several times, the House of Wittelsbach will rule Bavaria from 1180 all the way up until 1918, and yes, they would indeed. also. They would also um, become periodically um, Count Palatine of the Rhine as well, and therefore have an electoral dignity. And this begins in um, 1214. And it's into this um, family that we have Louis IV, the Bavarian. Now, interestingly, he has a very close connection with the, the House of Habsburg. His mother is Habsburg, um, Matilda. His grandfather is Rudolf, um, King Rudolf, and his uncle is um, King Albert. And this is where we have, again, an interesting family feud between Frederick von Habsburg, the handsome, and Louis IV, because the two are, you know, warded together, they are brought up together. And, um, but then they very quickly, once they both reach maturity, they enter into this dispute over the suzerainty of Lower Bohemia, sorry, Lower um, Lower Bavaria. And this begins with the first Wittelsbach Habsburg rivalry, which again will last a very long time, hundreds of years. In fact, the Wittelsbach will finally be able to put on another emperor during the War of Austrian Succession in the 18th century to show how long this um, rivalry lasts. It's um, hundreds and hundreds of years of rivalry. But um, Louis IV defeats the Habsburgs at the Battle of um, Gammelsdorf in 1313 when Henry the um, III is still king. And this um, emphasizes the fact that Louis IV is not this sort of minor noble. He's actually got prestige in his own right, he's a capable military commander, and he could potentially lead, um, you know, he could potentially be emperor. And as with um, the House of Luxembourg, you know, when Henry III dies, the electors again, we are not going to elect a, another um, dynastic, you know, appointee. We're not going to elect his son as emperor. You know, we hold the dignity that we are freely electing a ruler of our own accord, and we're not going to, you know, uh, countenance a dynasty. So mm -hmm. weirdly, the Luxembourg party, rather than electing John of Bohemia, as um as as king of the romans and later holy roman emperor um the pro luxembourg party instead focuses on louis louis the fourth as a potential candidate to prevent the habsburgs taking and over. they do this and they do this just to sort of spite any any possibility of of, of a dynastic situation you know? well it's not just that it's the idea that i mean it's not just out of spite it should be realized that um the electors are now in a position which will just grow from here on where they can make and unmake emperors and the idea of having a weak emperor allows the individual electors to build up their own centers of power independent of any overarching imperial authority so a weak emperor works for their own um local interests and a strong emperor could potentially lead to a situation with frederick the second frederick the second or frederick barbarossa where we have this attempt to create a autocratic imperial authority which will deprive us of all our rights and as such basically, basically be... after you marcus uh, i was going to say and and there's bound to be also on a in a number of different ways whether it's um you know strategic imperatives whether it's um you know acquisition of wealth or authority be it locally or or, or further beyond their their local holdings um, there's bound to be horse trading between the electors. They're bound to have different um, priorities and different allegiances, which would vary from time to time and across emperor to emperor. 
Indeed, yes. And I suppose they're also looking westward to the situation in France and the kind of centralization that they're seeing there with horror. Absolutely. And this, this should be... Sorry, oh, I was just going to say, no, no, you're right, Ian. I was just going to say that the one thing I did want to reference, because I actually didn't know this uh, um, particular point, is that I knew that uh, Bavaria had been aligned to Austria, predominantly based upon a its strategic location and also its Catholicism. You know, certainly um, later on in, in time when we have the rising of, of the Protestant, we have the you know the post um, Westphalian kind of situation in Europe. But I had no idea that um, Ludwig uh, the Fourth was uh, half Habsburg. So there's kind of a dynastic link between the Habsburg Habsburgs and the Wittelsbach as well. Yes, well, I, I didn't know that. But what I think uh, should be contrasted is that I don't see this Bavarian alliance with. I mean, even though they're both become stalwartly Catholic. Interestingly, you know, one half of the Wittelsbach family will become Protestant in the uh, Palatinate and the other half will become Quite Catholic. Indeed, indeed, yes. <laughs> but um, what, is, what is important to note is that I, I would say the Wittelsbach and the Habsburgs were in fact consistent rivals all the way up until after the Napoleonic Wars. And I do mean after the Napoleonic Wars, because even during the Napoleonic Wars, the Bavarians allied with the French at the expense of the Austrians. And, you know, during, uh, so, so, so again, I don't want to go too much into this because we're going, you know, way across, you know. Um, no, 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 we are, no, no. I'll, I'll, I want to just talk more about Ludwig IV specifically. I'll just use that yes. as a reference point. Yes, absolutely. And talking about Ludwig IV, in terms of the beginning of this um, Habsburg uh, Wittelsbach rivalry, his old childhood friend who had just been at war with Frederick um, the Handsome is brought up again in a civil war. And it looks like from 1316, because again, one of the effects of these, you know, the early electors is that four electors will typically choose a pro-Ghibelline emperor and three electors would choose a pro guelph emperor so louis actually has just three elector electoral appointments technically he didn't win the election technically frederick did but nevertheless there was a split and the idea of unanimous um, elections aren't going to come in until later and so frederick is technically you know the legitimate king and um, he wages a successful war up until the Battle of um, Moldov in 1322, after which um, Louis not only defeats Frederick, but captures him. And we have this um, two year long period where Frederick is um, a captive of um, King Louis. And this again is one of the most remarkable turnarounds in um, German history, that after you know, Louis is compelled to release Frederick because he receives a um, excommunication. And um, basically, the Pope wants to divide the authority of the empire between them so as to nullify the threat of a, poten you know, a potential Ghibelline restoration in Italy. And rather than doing this you know, with resentment, Louis has this um, dramatic reconciliation with Frederick, and the two happily agree to rule as um, co-regions. Louis IV goes you know, south into um, Italy to be crowned emperor in 1328, and he's more than happy to allow Frederick von Habsburg to rule Germany as um, King of the Romans until you know he dies in 1330, which is you know which is remarkable. Never and again after the Habsburg you know rivalry at the beginning of the reign, we have a shift during the second half of Louis where Louis betrays the pro pro Luxembourg elements that had elected him in the first place and forms an alliance with the Habsburgs at the expense of the House of Luxembourg. So, just to to illustrate this, he's crowned emperor in 1328 again the second emperor you know since um frederick ii and um from this point on from 1330 he begins a policy of aggressive dynastic aggra aggrandizement for the house of wittelsbach so in 1323 he had claimed brandenburg after the demise of the house of Ascania, and brandenburg becomes you know a, a wittelsbach um, domain in 1340, he acquires Lower Bavaria and therefore unites Bavaria for the first time. In 1342, and again, this shows his rivalry with the House of Luxembourg, the House of Luxembourg had claimed the County of Tyrol through marriage. And in 1342, as in his position as emperor, he orders the Count to disavow his wife so that she can marry one of the Emperor's sons and therefore he can claim Tyrol. Which is which is quite incredible in terms of um, market sort of um, imperial corruption and authority at the expense of the House of Luxembourg. I was going to say that's a hell of a power play too, you know. To yes, just exactly. Title, uh, basically <laughs> it might be a power play, but um, uh, you're not making a, a lot of friends. No, that's true. Like forcing a minor noble to a divorce or a wife, and in order to marry a son. I mean, that's a that's a very good way to earn the uh, enmity of uh, of rivals. 
And indeed he does. And um, in 1345, this goes beyond on because his wife has um, some distant claim to um, some low country um, titles. He seizes control of Haino, which is in Wallonia, of Holland, of Friesland and of Zeeland, you know, all of which in the, mod the modern day Netherlands. Um, and you know, claims, the claims of the House of Wittelsbach. And as you see on this map, um, these are you know, vaguely, you know, the the imperial and dynastic holdings of all these families, all of which are coinciding and often which are competing. So for example, Luxembourg would take over um, Brandenburg after the um, the Wittelsbach sort of break up. And this is precipitates, as you say, you know, a, a war with the House of Luxembourg. In 1346, the electors raise um, John of Bohemia's, you know, John, John the Blind's son, Charles, in a civil war. And it looks like, you know, Louis is going to have a complete victory because the Luxembourgs make stupid mistakes, such as, for example, you're all aware of the Battle of Crecy, one of the uh, you know, defining wars of the battles of the Hundred yeah, Years' War. The Black Prince. The, the, the uh, no, privacy of the Longbow. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, John, of John of Bohemia um, comes down and he's he's actually sort of chained to his horse, you know, blind and goes and dies in that battle. And um, his son is in that battle as well and barely makes out alive. And it looks at, at once that the House of Luxembourg might have been snuffed out of the Battle of Crecy. Nonetheless, they return. And through an act of God, this is also the um, the beginning of the Black Death in Europe, 1346, 1347. Um, Louis IV, the Bavarian, dies. And so Charles, you know, basically as a result of this act of God, um, is left in a position where he can become the next Holy Roman Emperor and restore the House of Luxembourg after yet, you know, an, another sort of house had taken over. Um, and to make matters worse, you know, Louis had, had I think, nearly half a dozen sons. And rather than the sons uniting around a obvious um, successor to, you know, claim the empire for the Wittelsbach. They descend they instead, into infighting. Yeah. They descend into infighting and prop up a, um, a nominal emperor, um, Gunther von Schwarzburg, as um, as the king, whilst they, you know, are squabbling over their dynastic inheritance. Gunther dies very quickly and the Wittelsbach lands divide and divide again. And in terms of like the constant division of these territories, they wouldn't re-coalesce around, you know, Bavaria until the, the end of the 15th century. And they wouldn't sort of put up any sort of, um, Bavaria wouldn't act as, you know, a major power in German affairs really until the 17th century. Um, so this is, you know, a rapid decline for the House of Wittelsbach and the House of Luxembourg come in and Charles von Luxembourg becomes emperor. And this is, again, remarkable, not for his achievements, but for, you can say his um, ratification of all of the themes that we've been discussing on the stream, which is um, the complete collapse of imperial authority and the rise of all of these new decentralized locuses of power. So. Charles IV comes in after the devastation, the economic devastation caused by the Black Death, and he is committed to simply achieve peace in the empire. P peace is his principal aim, other than trying to ensure the succession of his own house and the elimination of um, the Wittelsbach and the Hohenstaufen. And through here, we have the most important event of his reign, which is the Golden Bull of 1356. Now, the effect of this Golden Bull is that it empowers the electors within the empire and regularizes and reg and regularizes the procedures of the elections of the empire and pivotally the electors are declared their principalities are declared indivisible and this means that not only does it ensure that the electors have a permanent power base but nominally this is to ensure that there isn't a contested election whereby you know there are two people claiming to be you know the Margrave of Brandenburg, and I'm going mm. to elect one emperor, and I'm going to elect another. So there's a tangible sort of um, benefit for the elections, but in reality, he's setting up and strengthening the powers of the electors vis-a-vis -vis the emperor, which will have a dramatic effect when we come to the um, the king, the the kingship of his son. And when he's you know, crowned crowned in Rome, he makes you know, I think this is in the year um, 13, 1355. Uh, Charles makes no attempt whatsoever to claim any sort of um, authority over the pope. Rather, he promises the Pope, I'll come in, I'll quickly be crowned, and then I'll leave the city immediately. And um, <laughs> and um, in terms of, again, ensuring a peace, of you. A polite of you. <laughs> And again, in terms of um, ensuring the stability of the empire, um, I mentioned the House of Wittelsbach. Well, um, the aggrandizement of the... Um, of, of the electors basically meant that they were confirmed in this position constitutionally, essentially. So the House of Wittelsbach were given the hereditary ranks of arch steward of the empire through the, you know, being the electors of the Platinate, even though Bavaria wouldn't achieve electoral status until the, um, the 17th century. Um, in a power move, um, one of the few power moves of Charles IV's reign, the Habsburgs were entirely omitted 
from this um, this grand investment of titles as a result of the Golden Bull. And um, in rather a pathetic, prote a pathetic protest, Rudolf IV, the, um, the Duke of um, Austria, convoked the um, Privilegium Maius. And the Privilegium Maius basically said that I am an archduke. It's a forgery. There's no sort of providence to the document. Um, the Austrians declare themselves archdukes, and rather than the emperor acknowledging it, the emperor simply ignores it. And rather than the Habsburgs proving to be any sort of feasible threat to the House of to the House of Luxembourg, throughout the latter half of the 14th century, the Habsburg dominions basically crumble. They decentralize, you know, Tyrol becomes its own independent duchy, um, further Austria becomes its own independent duchy, Styria becomes its own independent duchy, etc. And the Habsburgs aren't able to make any sort of um, effective case, you know, for their restoration to the empire. But what is, again, principal about the Golden Bull is that Charles IV had made the devolution of the empire, this process that we've been talking about, the dissolution of central authority, not only you know a fact, but a constitutional fact. It was now a legal fact of the empire that could not be changed. And this mm. confirms, again, another German word, uh, word um, Landsherrschaft, the, the rule of local lordships or the territorial rule of these possessions. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, arises, we mentioned the, the free cities, the new cities, sprinkling all across the Osiedlung. But we have... Um, imperial cities also being um, proclaimed around the same time, often in opposition to the emperors themselves, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit later. So, so um, this, um, this sort of um, Charles ignoring the, you know, the forgery and the title of Archduke, is that because of his sort of peace policy? You know, he, he doesn't want to, you know, pl plunge the empire into a new conflict. Um, in terms of ig ignoring it, well, essentially, like I said, he has no reason to acknowledge it because it's a forgery. I mean, basically, you know, most most historical sources point to the fact it's a forgery. And like I said, this is um, some desperate attempt on the Habsburgs to claim some sort of, um, you, you can say, re retention of prestige in the aftermath mm -hmm. of this um, omission from the, the actions of the Golden Bull. You know, m many titles such as, you know, Arch Cupbearer of the Empire, you know, Arch Chamberlain of the Empire, Arch Steward of the Empire have been bestowed onto all of the various electors you can see on the map here with their individual flags. But um, Austria wasn't even technically an elector. So they, again, they're only going to come to power in the middle of the 15th century due to um, a unique, you know, series of circumstances which will make for another stream. But during this period, the Habsburgs are basically, you know, cut out of um, power and the visuals back, you know, take over that position from the Habsburgs. So yes, it's, it's remarkable really that they make that comeback, but this sort of, um, again, is almost too ta tangential because the death of um, Charles leads to yet another second interregnum. Um, he reigns you know, quite a long time, 30 years and dies in 1378. And you know, one, basically, despite the fact he's given up all of this um, you know, authority to all of the local lords. And this is, you know, a, a, this is not just a dramatic sort of one off. I think it's important to note that um, due to the incredibly precarious situation of the empire post Frederick II, every time a king of Germany was elected, um, a king had to promise to make all of these concessions to the ability to confirm their privileges. Really, what we see in 1356 is the greatest example of that, of the confirming of the privileges and the ability and the fact that the emperor's authority is severely curtailed and limited. And by 1378 we have the house of luxembourg survives and for the first time you have the principle of dynastic succession um why did the electors allow it because venceslaus is basically powerless um not only did was the empire divided with the golden ball or ratified the d division of the empire but we have the division of the of the um von luxembourg lands as well so um Bohemia, as in Bohemia proper, not even Moravia, is the only land inherited by Wenceslaus. All the other territories, whether it be, you know, Brandenburg or Moravia or Luxembourg itself, are given over to other sons of um, of Emperor Charles IV. So not only does, you know, Wenceslaus only inherit this territory, he barely controls Bohemia either. And this is what you're going to see with the, the Hussite Wars later on, Columba, is that um, the nobles in Bohemia are going to exercise this tremendous power at the expense of the king. First, it's led by the, the House of Rosenberg. Then, to make matters worse, the same year that um, he's elected, Wenceslaus is elected, you have the Western Schism. So in 1378, oh. you have a Pope in Avignon, you have a Pope in Rome, and in 1409 onwards, you're going to have a Pope in Pisa as well. So from 1309, 1409 until 1418, there are three Popes at the same time or claiming, you know, um, universal sovereignty. And what, what's the effect of this? It means that the emperor needs to 
and maintain this incredible balancing act between supporting a pope which is supported by his political allies and supported by foreign powers and supported by his subjects because otherwise he could basically be considered to be supporting an anti-pope and you know basically could be mm. considered like a precursor of the antichrist so this destabilizes an even worse situation and you know add into that as well we have the beginning of the hussite heresy with jan hus as well which is you know really the forerunner to the reformation with um martin luther it really begins in Bohemia a hundred years before um, Martin Luther. All of these um, events um, cascade on Wenceslas at the same time. And to make matters worse, because his authority in Bohemia is so weak, he never leaves Bohemia. You know, the German, the German princes, the German um, electors are basically pleading with him. They convene imperial councils or Reichstags to demand that the emperor deal with, you know, the complete lawlessness within the empire, the, the ascendancy of the robber barons, and um, the emperor won't leave. And it becomes so bad that the electors demand that the emperor meets them at um, Lennart Castle in 1400. And when he turn, fails to turn up, Wenceslaus is declared deposed on account of futility, idleness, negligence, and ignobility. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not a good time, huh? Not a good time. So again, it should well, demonstrate... At least, they, at least they weren't um, halfway in accusing him of uh, a, a little bit of wrongdoing. <laughs> so, so again, it should be emphasised just the complete, uh, again, overriding collapse of um, imperial authority within within the centre, within the German centre. And, you know, it goes from bad to worse. Wenceslas is still king of Bohemia, and this is where we have the rise of his brother Sigismund. As I mentioned, all of these other Lux Lux um, Luxembourg princes have been given, you know, dominion over all these territories. In, I think it's 1383, or something along there, 1386, um, Sigismund is elected as King of Hungary. And from then on, he becomes the most powerful of all the um, Luxembourg princes. And in order to, you know, control his brother, in order to control Bohemia, he actually imprisons his brother and basically rules effectively in his stead. And I mean, in terms of like, who becomes the king at this point, I mean, it barely even matters. You have, um, mm the election of another Wittelsbach, Rupert, um, the last Wittelsbach to become emperor until the Austrian War of Succession. And then you have a, another minor member of the House of Luxembourg, um, Jobs de Brandenburg. And then you have Sigismund. You know, Sigmund, Sigismund in um, 411, he finally inherits the empire. He inherits Brandenburg. He inherits finally Bohemia from his brother in 1419. And he is you know, appointed king of the Romans and king of the Hungarians. But you know, he's most famous for, you know, not, they're definitely not famous for um, his imperial administration. I mean, one of the first acts he commits to, which makes him um, infamous in, in history, is the Crusade of Nicopolis, which, you know, if anyone knows, Nicopolis is one of the first concerted European attempts to drive the Ottomans out of Europe, and it ends in a complete disaster for the um, uh, the imperial crusading forces in 1395. You know, led, among other people, not just the emperor, but also the um, the later Duke of Burgundy. John the Fearless, and um, Bayezid, you know, looks as if he's about to conquer Constantinople before he himself is then defeated by Tamerlane a few years later. So um, it could have led to, you know, the conquest of Constantinople 50 years earlier had it not been for the intervention of um, the Timurids in the east. Again, just mentioning, you know, Sigismund's, you know, ineffective attempt and to claw back some form of... Um, what's the word imperial prestige he forms the order of the dragon uh, which you know for anyone know you know, anything about the history of romania draculisti house of the dragon of course he was a member of this order of the dragon it was basically a chivalric order aimed at limiting the directly limiting the influence of the ottoman empire was founded by sigismund among other things now i've been That's conscious true. before i finish this that i've been talking for way too long so does anyone want to make any contribution <laughs> i mean I, mu I must say um that this area is not um it's not my expertise and it's fiendishly complex so i've just been um i've just been listening and enjoying your your elucidation i must be honest yeah that's that's times two but what what, <laughs> what what i what i um i do have to say because the thing is you know germany is a is a really odd case and i, I find that you know given given the mindset we have towards this part of the world, be it Poland, be it, you know, be it Germany or the Baltics or even Russia, you know, for, for whole before regions, and I don't need to expand on why that's the case. You know, we, we, we are often neglected an opportunity to look into these subjects more deeply. 
and when you look at these um these countries in these regions, had they have a deep and a and a, and a really complex and in interesting history, and I think it's a real um it, it's a real reflection and a negative reflection on our um on our sort of education systems and and on our on our modern day culture that these times and these um circumstances are just a non entity, and it's such a pity. There are so many interesting things that occur at this time, and they're they're very much overlooked. You know, to the extent where two or three of us in the chat <laughs> don't really know what's going on ourselves. <laughs> so, um, you know, no, it's wonderful. Um, and you know, and, and for those in the chat too, I'm sure it's very illuminating for them. So, um, no, it's great. Um, you know, it's uh, the more the more this uh, knowledge is uh, propagated in the public sphere, the better. So. Well, um, I, hate, I hate to be presumptuous. I mean, I, I find my own sort of um, historical rambling rather tedious, but for some um, <laughs> completely unfathomable reason, people seem to enjoy me rambling about this sort of area of history, some people at least. <laughs> so, large, um, large German audience, perhaps. <laughs> Who knows? Or large oh my God, audience. <laughs> so, um, so, so, I mean, uh, this is getting onto subject which you're, you're really interested uh, in Colombo, which are the, the Hussite Wars and the Hussite faction. Um, just before, again, in terms of notable achievements of Sigismund when he's king of the Romans, um, he successfully ends the Western, um, the, yes, the Western Schism, basically through imperial intervention. In 1414, we convene the Council of Constance, and basically the, the popes agree, you know, to relinquish their power and agree to one pope who will now you know forever be situated in rome the avignon papacy has ended and so has the um the pisan papacy among other things and um due to again direct imperial intervention we have the council of constance we have the end of the western schism but again tragically coinciding with what you consider to be this unifying moment for christendom after a century of um you know of, of papal infighting and basically a civil war within the papacy, you know, beginning with the um, death of um, Bonifacio VIII and the uh, Babylonian captivity and then escalating from um, 1378 onwards. We have the beginning of the Hussite Wars and this is precipitated because in 1415, Jan Hus is of course declared a heretic. And in 1419, Jan Hus is burned at the stake. And from 1419 to 1434, we have five Hussite wars, all of which you know directed in Bohemia, in the um, the heartland of you know the emperor's possessions in Bohemia, the heart of the Luxembourg monarchy. And this results not not only in a complete victory for it doesn't result in a complete victory for the imperial party or the catholic party instead it's a victory for the coalition of the catholics and the moderate hussite factions allying against the radical hussites or the taborites and when we have you know sigmund's imperial coronation in 1433 it's a bittersweet victory for the house of luxembourg because of course he is the last male descendant of the House of Luxembourg, he will only leave daughters behind. He dies in 1437, and with him, you know, the House of Luxembourg will die forever. And the his own heartland, his own imperial heartland of Bohemia, I, th you know, has potentially lost up to you know one to 1.5 million people as a result of this um 15 year series of five successive crusades. So yeah, Bohemia terrible, is devastated, and I think um because you're particularly invested in the innovation of um military tactics during this period, Columbo, would you like to elucidate more a bit more on that? Yeah, sure. So um, I mean, of course, you you must consider the location, right? I mean, we're in we're in Eastern Europe, and so you have all sorts of um, influences coming in from the south, from the east, and it's in this period in the 1400s, you know, um, that firearms um, come in really for the first time in a big way. And in fact, the Hussite Wars are one of the um, um, one of the first cases where they're really used um, um, in a large way. And one of the reasons for this is that um, the Hussite movement is, is is essentially a sort of uh, you know a popular a popular movement right um, um and it's and it's also um at least uh, at least to some extent a rebellion of the sort of czech and the slavic population against their sort of um um germanic overlords we might say i mean the hussites even help the the poles in their war against the the teutonic order and, and what have you you know they send troops um and you know the hussites are you know extremely extre extremely radical in their beliefs and and as the situation grows more desperate i mean they even have you know they have women fighting and uh, and things like this and so in a situation like this um where you know they're opposed to the sort of um you know the chivalric orders and what have you um the, you know these are basically a bunch of peasants facing down hev heavy cavalry right 
Um, um, and so they need to find some way of dealing with these engagements. And so they turn to, you know, primitive primitive firearms, um, um, which can be wielded by by anyone. You know, they turn to firearms and they turn to crossbows, um, which are sort of, you know, um, peasant weapons, I suppose. Uh, and then we have um, um, one of the Hussite leaders. Um, I think his name's Jan Zizka. And Jan Zizka is actually um, um, very important in this regard because he develops... Um, um um sort of wagon warfare right i mean i mean you know you you, you think of um um you know in the old west in america on the oregon trail you know if they got attacked by indians or something they would they would um form up their wagons and then sit behind them with the guns you know so that they um they didn't take the full brunt of the charge and um these tactics improvised are used cover, by so to speak. sorry improvised cover so to speak Yes, improvised improvised cover, um, and and so this is what the Hussites do. Um, um, they 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 um, they they begin to use wagons. I think um, in a first couple of desperate engagements, and then they realize um, it's such a successful strategy to have um, um, your men with their with their firearms on the top of the wagons, and then have um, you know, a tight group of halberds or spearmen at the bottom. Um, and it's pretty much impenetrable by heavy cavalry, and so they win a bunch of really thumping victories in this regard. Um, this is one of the reasons why it goes on for so long, you know, and of course they get accused of um, um, using, using, you know, dishonorable tactics and what have you. I mean, there's a similar sort of, um, 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 you know, similar controversies going on further west as well. You know, you have the increasing, increasing use of the crossbow and the sort of controversy around that as well. Um, so that's so that is um, um, one major effect of these wars is the is the popularization of firearms. But there are, of course, massive, uh, massive and horrific casualties. And, and you mentioned the sort of instability that this caused there. I mean, one thing that I would also say is, um, um, you know, um, just across the border from where a lot of this craziness is going on, you have places like Würzburg. Right. And, you know, um, um, later on. Um, not that much later on, mind you, you know, once you have um, Luther and what have you, I mean, you have a lot of peasant discontentment in this area. And part of the reason for that is, as you said, um, um, this area had just become so desperately impoverished. You know, I mean, you'd already had the plague rip through and then you had had these decades of war um, um, and very extreme war as well. In some cases where basically no quarter was given. Um, and so it led to this, this situation of extreme instability and discontentment amongst the peasants and, um, and um, and um, um, worsening relations between the peasants and the nobility and what have you. Absolutely, and um, thank you very much for, for that, Columbo. Um, unless May you I want to, to yes, sure, uh, absolutely. Just, just, just if I can touch on the military side of things, uh, awfully briefly, is that um, what you mentioned there, Columbo, is quite um, uh, quite interesting with the with the, the the wagons and the and using the the log spears or the halberds in conjunction with what I, I'm presuming would have been like a, like an arquebus, like a really primitive early sort of yes, yes, arrow, really or a which, hand cannon, really simple stuff. Yeah, yeah. which uh, for those in the chat who aren't you know particularly well read in military history, very early uh, sort of hand cannons and arquebuses had extremely high failure rates and were almost as likely to kill the users as the person. <laughs> yeah, on yeah the, you wouldn't on the, catch on the me using one, put it that way. No, um, <laughs> but, but when, when reliable and when used correctly was still a useful weapon, which is why sort of, you know, there is this period of time from, you might say, the, the discovery, their initial usage throughout the next 100, 150 years, you see the eventual um, moving away from the crossbow and the and the you know, really you could say the disappearance of archery in warfare, broadly speaking, to a use of firearms. And there's this interesting kind of uh, transition, um, and it occurs in several paces. It, it, it sort of in different circumstances and in different ways, it manifests in different ways. But it, within this time period, this sort of century. You have the Flemish defeating French knights, um, the, the, the infamous Flemish militia who fought yeah, as pikemen. Yeah. Um, the Scots improvised with pikes against heavy cavalry against the Yeah, English they used the Shiltrons against Edward, you know, yeah. The Shiltrons, yeah, you know, spare as long as a man, as they say in Braveheart. <laughs> uh. And, yes, um, that film is a one hundred percent accurate reference. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So, so many but no, you are you are right. I mean, I mean, you know, it's it's um, not just the um, it's not just the economic and theological yeah. um developments in this period that are laying the groundwork for what we can call you know the modern world. I mean, you know, you have the ascendancy mm. of the merchants and the Reformation and what have you. Yeah. But yeah, you see um, you see the, the 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 genesis of um, what would get called you know pike and shot warfare, right? Which is exactly. you know, I mean, if you think exactly. of the the, the Landsknechts and 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 the Swiss Swiss guards and um, the yeah. strategies that become so popular in the Renaissance. This is uh, this well, is its genesis yeah. here. Yeah, and 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 you have these 
I don't want to say simultaneously, they don't happen at the, the exact same moment. With, within a, a, a very um, close proximity of time, in a, in a very relatively narrow band and umbrella of, of time period, you know, like I said, you have the Flemish, you have the Scots, you have the infamous Swiss Pike and then the Swiss halberdiers who become famed, uh, you know, as you say, they, they become the Swiss Guard for the Pope slightly later on. Um, and also with the Hussite Wars here in Bohemia, this sort of combination of, um, of, of spears and halberds with shot, which one might say is probably mastered by the Spanish with the use of, with the with the creation of the tercio, the um, the, the tercio yes, squares, yes. um, which would become a, a massive part of this Renaissance period Habsburg warfare, because obviously for them they have this, the Austrian holdings and the Spanish holdings, and I'm sure mm. I am will probably get there at a point sometime in the future. But it, it's interesting that these um this uh, infantry revolution, I think, uh, mind you, called that it, it, it occurs in this sort of 50, 100, 150 period, but in several places, almost at once. It's just one of those really interesting sort of yes. uh, transformations that, it that, is. that occurs. It is. And um, it's even, um, it's happens, even you know? yeah, no, I, but I don't think it is ha happenstance, right? Because it coincides with um, these increasing... I, 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 I mean, happenstance insofar that they, they, these efforts weren't coordinated, like they weren't secret yeah, actions. Yeah, yeah, no, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but one, one other thing that I would note with regards to, you know, this... um this new style of fighting that is coming about um in many ways perhaps we could characterize it as more democratic or if not democratic then less aristocratic right because i mean you yeah. know he heavy cavalry also begins to die out at this time alongside yeah. um um you know these ideals of, of of chivalry you know which you know in the last stream we talked about this you know you're in the high middle ages yeah. and these ideas yeah. are in the absolute ascendancy um yeah. it's at the end of this period post plague um 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 you know the the reformations brewing mm. the peasant revolts mm. are brewing and um and this old world begins to die and yes. and i think um oh sorry i am i'll finish on this point I'll, I'll be very brief i think um what you have with the defeats of the english in scotland um the the the, the, and the massive number of french um aristocracy that had literally butchered at battles such as Cressy and Agincourt, the, the, the halting of the French by the Flemish militia in the battles against the Flemish. Um, and like you say, then with the onset of plague, there simply isn't this excess of the noble class to form these large bodies of aristocratic fighting men. And so, like you say, you kind of have this, uh, democratization isn't the right word, but this sort of, this, um, this commonality that appears mm. in, in the, the the, the formation of armies from this period onwards, and it definitely has an, an impact going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think the word that I would use is disillusionment. You know, many of these ideals um, um, after the plague and after all these terrors that oh. we've had just didn't have the same kind of force yeah. that they did before. And, people had, people had it, become more cynical, you know? Quite, and it also plays in too with the, because with the, obviously the crusade doesn't fail in the Baltics. It doesn't fail with the Reconquista but it very, very infamously fails in the Levant, in Outremer. And, you know, we, we, I'm sure we'll get to the battles of Varna and the Coppola Slater, which are against the, the, the you know, ascendant Ottomans. But this, this, this destruction of the Christian crusading ideal happens around the same time as these other military defeats in Europe, which sort of lessens, it really tarnishes the, 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 the allure of this, you know, crusader, um, you know, fighting knight ideal. Indeed, and it's also at the same time that you have people like, um, you know, I mean, uh, well, I suppose Boccaccio is slightly later, but Petrarch and what have you, right? As this disillusionment is setting in, they're 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 bringing back classical texts, you know, they're they're trawling yeah. through all of the um, all of the old monasteries and libraries, um, and it births the Renaissance, which which um, which comes later. Which also, by the way, I mean, I mean, you know, the Renaissance, there there are a lot of you know high ideological things going on, but it was also because of um, um, you know the financial system that had come about. You know, you had um, usurers and moneylenders and, and and these trading networks which had been set up um, in the north as well. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, you have, you have cities like Antwerp springing up and becoming huge. Centers. Um, and then the art follows, um, which is a which is an unfortunate pattern for an art lover to notice. But um, but but um, it would be it would be ignorant to ignore it. Mm. Yes, my my only well, well, thank you for both both your contributions there. The the only thing I'll sort of you know make a proviso is that some um, it's, it's going to be a nice segue when we really get into and elucidate these concepts when we discuss this in episode. 10, 11, and 12, which will focus, first of all, on the Hundred Years' War, then on the... Um, <laughs> so to speak. 
then on the rise of the Habsburgs, then on the Italian wars, obviously. So all of these things are going to be mentioned in the dev. And of course, we're going to be talking about the rise of the Ottomans on the 9th of August. So tune in for that sort of information regarding the, the military success of the Ottomans. But just getting back may, to... You know, may, I, may I just quickly answer Iron Duke, sorry, just very briefly. Um, sure. Iron Duke, I, I wasn't saying that necessarily was definitive. Um, you're quite correct to say the cavalry remained relevant up until up until World War One, and I mean, I am. We sort of spoke about this too in the Bismarck stream about you know the victory against um, in the Franco-Prussian War, the use of cavalry by the Prussians. And uh, I just wanted to say there was sort of like the beginning of the transition of the cavalry to Spanish yes. overnight. But but it's uh, not so much it's not so much I'm the not, cavalry I'm itself. Wrong. I'm just saying that I might have not articulated that properly. Yeah. I mean, it's not so much that cavalry itself becomes totally unimportant, although it does decline in, in terms of this absolute importance that it had um, lessened, yes. yes but it's also this yeah the, these ideals of chivalry and the noble knight yeah, these exactly. things die off you know yeah. that's more what i was trying to emphasize exactly you got yeah. it thank you yeah all right Sorry, back to you am <laughs> <laughs> yes well well hopefully we'll have something to talk about when we revisit these topics later on but um <laughs> oh we'll be fine don't worry we'll be fine yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure a bit of overlap doesn't really, people won't mind too much. I'm sure it's helpful. Um, so yes, getting to like the final sort of summary on this topic, um, when we have the, or side long cities, you know, established as free cities in the 13th and 14th centuries, of course, lead to the imperial recognition of imperial cities, cities that had once been part of the imperial administration founded by emperors and kings. And often, you know, these would occur in Franconia or in Swabia, et cetera, the hearts of imperial power. Um, often these would be devolved to local magistrates who, after a time, would begin to essentially, you know, run these cities as their own, um, you know, as a basically autonomous magistrates and eventually the cities would achieve a legal autonomy you know from the rest of the empire often conferred on by the emperor himself hence imperial city and this would be the case in you know Mulhouse and Alsace, um, Mimigan and Ravensburg and Swabia and you know in other such cases slightly more complicated such as in Cologne where you have an imperial city we have an imperial city in Cologne itself but they maintain some sort of nominal vestige with the authority of the archbishop of Cologne whose residence isn't in Cologne but it's in Bonn which was the capital of West Germany during um, the Cold War, then other cities like Augsburg, again, gaining independence from a local ecclesiastic authority. And by the 15th century, the diffusion between these free cities and imperial cities is basically blurred, whereby you have this common association of these entities as free imperial cities. And um, where, where is the highest concentration of these cities? They exist in the Swabian territories with the complete and utter dissolution of that duchy in 1268, which probably leads to one of the most accelerated um, places for, you know, decentralization in the entirety of Europe at this point. And, you know, like the Hansa, as we mentioned, the Hanseatic League, in 1331, these cities form a Swabian League for mutual defense against you know first it's louis the fourth the bavarian then it's um charles the fourth because whilst charles the fourth is again conferring all these dignities upon um the prince electors and um creating this you know territorial noble administration um these imperial cities are becoming not only independent but they're becoming incredibly wealthy so the emperor wants to have some sort of leverage over these cities in order to exercise you know economic interests for them one of the reasons again the emperors were willing to give these cities you know autonomy in the first place was due to the economic benefits that accrued from it from creating these um autonomous city states and uh, as you mentioned with the um the rise of the um the, the Swiss armies, we have the creation of an independent Switzerland during this period. So from, as ironically, as we mentioned, the Habsburg domains begin in Argau in Switzerland, but in Switzerland, we have the first sort of major result again, a revolt against um, imperial power. So from 1291, we have the creation of the first old Swiss confederacy. And from 1291 until the 15th century, and really, you know, with the Burgundian Wars in the late um, 15th century, you know, cities such as Bern and Lucerne were able to consistently defeat the Habsburgs in their attempt to um, hold on to their position, their, their possessions in Switzerland. And um, as we see, we see the creation of this united confederacy of the city-states that would evolve and basically become the independent Swiss state towards the 17th century. Meanwhile, in the north, we have the Hansa, which by 1400 exercised this colossal commercial influence, which it didn't just extend to Northern Germany, as you can see on this map, but it extended all the way from Russia 
even to England, and even had some very minor interest in the Atlantic and even in Italy. And they were able to exercise a virtual monopoly over all trade in the Baltic Ocean and the North and the North Sea. And routinely, the League collectively would act as a, you know, a casus belli for war against Denmark, because yeah, I was Denmark say, of course, over control of the straits, yeah. over control of the um the sound toll, and over control of access of the um the North Sea and the um Baltic Sea. In fact. Um, of course, during the same time, the 14th century, we have in the 15th century, we have the creation of the Kalmar Union, the first time that um, Sweden, you know, well, not the first time, really the substantive time where Sweden, Norway and Denmark would all be ruled by a single king. And this was partly like the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, an attempt to resist the economic influence of the Germans. And really what we see at the beginning of the second rise of the Habsburgs, which provide the, the basis for, I think, episode 11, just going off my memory, um, Germany had definitively decentralized, maintaining hundreds and at some point thousands of independent principalities from the 15th century until the 18th century. Yeah, you know, when we talk about the rise of the Habsburgs, the Habsburgs are going to take over territories such as Hungary, they're going to take over territories such as the Lowlands, such as Burgundy, such as Bohemia. But when we look at a Germany that we recognize today, the Habsburg influence was virtually non-existent in terms of direct imperial administration. They held on to territory, say for example, in Swabia, which would, you know, encounter further Austria. But during this period, you know, what we discussed, the, the Great Interregnum, we are really seeing the definitive decline of you know sent uh, positions of central administration and when we see you know the, the the return of centralized administration it's not really going to be until the 18th century until long after we've had the 30 years war and we've had the um, peace to westphalia and we see the arrival of relatively modern states such as um Saxony, such as Hanover, such as Bavaria, and of course, principally among all of them, the state of Prussia, which will become mm. a military great power by the end of the 18th century. And just coinciding with this period, whilst we see this rapid decentralization within the empire itself, as we've elucidated, we also see the end of the Ossidlung. We see the end of this great period of expansion. Um, a kingdom such as Bohemia, uh, you mentioned um, Germ Germ Germanified. I think it's important to know that Bohemia, with its Czech and German nobility, would become this odd exception where they weren't entirely, you know, pro-Czech or, you know, pro-German either way until the Battle of White Mountain in 1620, yes. when um, the at the beginning of the um, Thirty Years' War, the Czechs are definitively subjugated by the House of Habsburg, and they wouldn't again be granted sort of serious concessions until the 19th century again. Whereas when it comes to German expansion in the East, when it comes to places like Prussia, we mentioned the great state of the Teutonic Order, which crossed over all of, you know, northern modern day Poland, you know, parts of um, Pomerania, um, parts of Prussia, and of course, Coronia, Livonia, and you know, Estonia would change periodically hands to the Danish at the same time. Um, this caused the creation of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, this um, need to unite against this um, Germanic invading force. So after this massive expansion, in 1410, you have, well, first of all, you have the, uh, I can't remember, the, the Gedimid um, dynasty, and then the Eugalia, um, Eugalian dynasty um, from Lithuania, and you have the end of the Pius dynasty in um, Poland, and you have the unification of these um, two empires, Poland and Lithuania, and again, militaristically for their own desire to defeat the um, united force of the Teutonic Order. They defeat them decisively at the Battle of Tannenberg, I think in 1410. And from that point on, the empires of Lithuania, and I think it's important to note that Lithuania was huge during the 15th century. Yeah, it's um, one they, of the most powerful um, nations in Europe at the time. It's one, of the most, it's one of the largest nations in Europe. It covers everything from Smolensk in the east, just west of Muscovy, all the way down to the Black, all the way down to the Black Sea and um, the modern city of Odessa in um, Ukraine today, all the way up to um, Koronia in the north and bordering on the Black Sea. So, yeah, a, a massive territory uniting with, um, again, Catholicized, you know, they converted to, mm -hmm. to Catholicism on their own impetus, not because of conquest uh, by the Teutonic Order and as you know, was the case with the Livonians and the um, and the Prussians. And with the defeat of Tannenberg, the Teutonic Order declines, and by 1466, they lose control of the um what we now know as you know the, the old sort of Polish corridor, Pomerania, the, the what would later become Royal Prussia, which would become joined with um Poland. And Prussia ultimately, in I think the 1525, 
would become subject to the Polish crown. And this wouldn't be a state of affairs which would be really reverse until the pressure of the 18th century arrived. So whilst you see the major expansion of the Germans eastward, it doesn't result in any sort of lasting impression in terms of overarching imperial authority because of the decentralized nature of the German expansion. When you have a concerted attempt to check this expansion by Poland, Lithuania, it is in fact, you know, definitively stopped for 300 years. I mean, from 1500 until the really until the partitions of Poland so that's beginning um the 1770s um the Germans do not expand eastward really what you mm. have is this legacy yeah. of all of these German pockets of all of these um German colonies such as the city of Riga such as the Baltics Germans such as the Prussian Germans who exist in these territories under other administrations I mean for example the Baltic Germans would become mm. integral in the Russian administration when the Russians conquered it in the Great Northern War, what you have is a huge sort of German diaspora expanded all across um, Eastern Europe, although Germany itself would shrink and diminish during this time. Mm. And of course, these sorts of um, r resentments and and frustrations and, um, and um, difficulties that the Germans have in the East and um, their, their somewhat isolated position in certain cases, especially when you, you, know, you get up into the Volga and what have you, um, this has massive, massive um, historical consequences. I mean, going all the way up to you know the last, the last World War, where many of these, uh, these, these, these notions are 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 played out and, and used as justification and what have you. Of course, yeah, and, and, there's, and that would be known as the Volksdeutsche or the Ostdeutsche as well. That there's one that there's one just um limitation I, I i don't particularly like this idea of a, a, a teleology in history whereby you know inevitably sets up you know this um the Ragnarok and this idea of you know the germans of the east and um heimatins reich the idea that the german reich has to include all of germans i mean really this when we talk about the ideological conception of germany um this only really comes about as a result of the aftermath of the first world war this doesn't sort of no, no, it's not so much. It's not so much that I agree with what they're saying, but certainly I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not this was the basis no, 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 for their no, rhetoric. No, no, you know? no, definitely, I'm not saying you agree. I'm just saying, you know, in terms of trying to see this as a definitive path in history, I think we should um, realize that again, many of the Germans, especially when it came to like Russian administration and beginning in Polish administration and even in Hungarian administration. There were vast, um, you know, German, you know, colonial movements as a result of the Ostseidlung and later, you know, during the the reconquest of Hungary from the Turkish Empire. But they would happily sort of go along with the local administrations, be they Hungarian, be they Polish, be they um, Russian, until yeah. I mean, there were many, there were many, um, there were many soldiers and officers of German descent who fought on the Russian side in the, in the war. You know, so yeah, it's 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 not obviously as clear cut as that. I was yes, really trying to as, highlight how important these narratives have been. Yes, and as and as Zenz, and as um Zenz was saying in the chat, yes, um the Germans did have a influential sway in Poland, Lithuania, and again this this idea of sort of modern contemporary nationalism is again something born out by the 19th century. You know, ironically, after um Poland, Lithuania had been you know de definitively partitioned and ended as an independent state but i think unless anyone has um anything to um to say i really need to get onto the super chats because we're already half an hour over time no um, no by I, all I means just, i'll just end on this point uh because you have this map up here uh because you're talking about um the you just talked about sort of the uh the weakening and the the not death rose it's not the right term but the, the teutonic order waning its power and there's two things to um that are worth referencing here is that one uh, in this time period too? Because I mean, I, I'm going to assume at some point we will talk about the Golden Horde, the Mongols, and what have you. Uh, there's the Battle of like the sort of Battle of Wallstadt, uh, which occurs in um, I think it's in 1240 or 1241, um, and the Teutonic Order have a fundamental representation uh, there alongside. They actually they fight they, they fight alongside um, many Polish nobles, and although they manage to partially check the mongols as in the this is really the mongols first um uh interaction with the like the, the western heavy knights and they they do kind of account for themselves relatively fully well mongol tactics still reign supreme and uh, the, they suffer heavy losses and in the case of the teutonic knights they really do lose, lose the cream of their um their sort of uh, uh elite leadership as it were and this has implications in the next sort of 100 150 years they well, you actually Marcus, you actually bring up an important point, which is something I, I've really forgotten to reference, really because it, it it doesn't happen. But really, there is, especially during the reign of um, Frederick II, 
um, there is this expectation that the Mongols during this time could have potentially conquered Europe and had gotten as far as the Atlantic. So during the um, you know the wars of the Gulfs and the Ghibellines, um, whilst the Teutonic Order are establishing themselves in Prussia, the Mongols have defeated the Poles and they have defeated the Hungarians. And it's really the cruel tie in the aftermath of the um, death of the um, uh, Kargan, the great Khan Ogadai, which stymies the um, continued conquest into Western Europe throughout the 1240s. Yeah, yeah there is the, there's, no, this, no, I, there's this idea that um, there's this idea that you know the the Poles saved us. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to um, disrespect the you know the, the 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 gallant service that they did there. But yeah, I mean the reason why. Um, the Mongol push collapsed as it did is because of infighting. <laughs> um, in, a, in a situation that's perhaps not entirely dissimilar to um, the situation of the Franks centuries before, you know, this vast empire is cut up. Um, I just want to say, I am just on the second point I was going to raise too, because uh, you, you mentioned about like the, the impact that, that German population pockets has as as a result of yeah uh, we're talking the the, po the post ostate sort of period and, and and the subsequent um influences that has on these regions you know whether they're talking about riga whether they're talking about you know northern poland or, or silesia or, or what have you is that um because you had a picture of um the fortress that was at marienburg uh, mm -hmm. do you want me to yeah. get the map up again Oh, oh, oh this, that, this, that photo oh, the, either the, yeah actually that's a good one because that's got the, the okay marienburg castle there you go um there's a good example and uh yeah so you have marienburg castle here and just on that map just um if you can see uh just where that yellow territory ends and it's that sort of maroni territory um just underneath that bottom arrow on that map you have the city of thorn all total you know in polish um a number of these sort of uh, fortifications that are built by the teutonic knights and in this period of, of their of their ascendancy in the zenith are dotted all across the land here and uh, uh, and like am says like the, the the conquest the expansion period of of the Teutonic Knights and the sort of colonization that follows these two things are symbiotic and they sort of function hand in hand and a, a profound influence um, exists in this part of the world at, at, at this time and a lot of a lot of towns uh, uh, that become cities are founded um, whether it's Danzig whether it's um, Königsberg whether it's Allenstein whether it's um I, I think Mimel I think is even founded by the Knights as well there's a whole a whole host of these places which become mm. uh, so sort of like we, when we talked about in the Roman streets, we talked about the establishment of the Roman colony. Uh, we talk about like Timgad and Tamagai and, um, and other and other Roman cities that established across like North Africa and Syria, for instance. Uh, you have a similar process of this being done here and these and, and the, the, the footprint and the remnants of, of this um, of this campaign are quite profound. Like Marienburg Castle is no small feat. The city of Königsberg, certainly prior to the end of World War II, is a very bitter um, series of battles fought here when the Eastern Front collapses in 1944-45. But Königsberg is this model Eastern German Prussian city that is yeah. very, it's a very beautiful, and it's a result of the of this time period, a result of the of the influence of the Ostdeutsch and of, of the Teutonic Knights. Yeah, I mean the entire and landscape has completely history. changed. Yeah, I mean especially along the Elbe. I mean you have loads of um loads of settlement, especially of Dutch settlers, and they just totally remake the landscape. It's also where this idea of you know orderly Germans in comparison to these you know reprobate Slavs <laughs> comes in, which of course I don't need to explain how that's been that's been used. But AM, I feel like you want to get onto super chats, my yes. friend. Well, no, just right, mentioning cities. I mean, I mean, you mentioned you mentioned Königsberg, you mentioned Marienburg, but I think it's also important to mention Berlin. Um, if, oh, had, it, be good, yeah. had it had it not been. <laughs> Had it not been had it not been for the Vendish Crusades, Berlin simply would not have existed because it would have existed in the center of this um, uh, plebeian Slav confederation. It was again beyond beyond the River Elbe. So again, even the capital of Germany itself is the consequence of the Ostsiedlung and as a result of the Northern Crusades, not just um, these territories which are now part of the Kalimbar, uh, Kalingrad Oblast in um, in Russia. So yes, without 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 further ado, we'll get to the super chats. Um, Benjamin Rood for two New Zealand dollars. Sieg mein Pastelichter. Well, thank you very much, Benjamin Rood. Another <laughs> one from Benjamin Rood uh, for another two dollars. Uh, hail, Min hail Mindaugas and damn the Teutonic invader. Well, sadly, we didn't get too much into the um, Lithuanian crusade. And sadly, I don't think we, we could have had time anyway. But um, thank you very much for your contrib contribution, Benjamin Rood. Uh, John Boy for 10 euros thank you very much uh just my appreciation of your work well well thank you very much john boy it means so much Thanks, uh okay thank i you, see sir. okay i see d's bit of rough has made a um token appearance on this stream 
goodness sake. Oh my god. Okay. Amazing stream, my dudes. Uh, Deus Fooligan. Uh, God fills. I mean, I, do you mean to say um, God fills this? Uh, you know, God wills it in German rather than Deus Volt. I'm not quite sure what you're trying to say there because that literally means um, God fills rather than God wills it. Um, okay. Um, God fills not... the, cup, the cup of thine life. He yes, does. all right. Or, or all cup right. runneth ever over. Okay. Um, Armok the Great for $20. Thank you very much, Armok the Great. Love your content. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much, Armok the Great. Um, the Duchy Bar for four ninety nine. Nothing to say. Please do say something in future. You know you're, you're paying me five pounds. You you can you can ask me any question. Uh, salad fork for ten Canadian dollars. Just popping in, but I've been watching the stream archive with great interest. Good job, lads. The teaching of history by mainstream sources is so abysmal that I can only assume that this is deliberate. Uh, well, yeah. that's a it's a dangerous question to answer in some sense. Yes, it is a dangerous question to answer, but I mean, it's it's really tragic that because you know I I really don't rate myself as much as a historian such as I am. So I think the fact that um you know, people do sort of enjoy my content, I think it's really just a sad reflection on the on the, the sort of um, accessible content out there. I, I don't mean to denigrate you, Columba or, or Marcus, but just just speaking for myself, not for the um for the whole channel. I, I think it's well. Sort of... I think I think I'm, I think I'm probably um, um, representing a lot of voices when I say that you're selling yourself short there. But I do agree with what you're saying. The the situation of um, historiography is parlous to say the least. Yes. So, um, but th thank you very much again. It's slightly this whole experience for me, you know, is rather incidental and rather strange. So, um, thank you, Salad Fork, um, Bolero three nine three for five US dollars. Thank you very much. In America, we study little continental history prior to the twentieth century. Your thorough scholarship is appreciated, as is your dignified accent. Well, thank you very much, Bolero three nine three. I'm not quite sure about my accent. I think it's very much overrated, but um, thank you. <laughs> Better than mine. <laughs> well, at least, at least the two of you don't have a colonial, colonial accent, so it could be worse. <laughs> we were we were colonized hundreds of years before we even knew about the existence of your continent, okay? Oh, dear. Don't, get, <laughs> don't get brave, brave heart out again. I think um, one of these days, Columba, you and I need to discuss Braveheart. I think that would be a wonderful that would conversation be for you and I to have. That would be really fun. Yeah. Anyway, uh, last. That'll be, be, good, that'll be a good chance to practice my Scottish accent. So by all means, let's. <laughs> oh, I look forward to hearing that. <laughs> yes, you could be you could be the token Mel Gibson on our stream, Marcus. Very appropriate of considering course, he's yeah. an Australian. Yeah. <laughs> based. <laughs> he is um, based. <laughs> Yeah, his films are terrible, though. Anyway, Herman Hoff for um, three pounds, just a big thumbs up. Well, um, thank you very much, Herman Hoff. Um, that's very kind of you. So, yes, unless um, anyone else has anything to say, we can um, we can get out of here only 40 minutes late. Two, <laughs> no, two, I, I, two, I need to go through very, my cat squealing. Two, two very brief things, if I may. One, uh, just a, not really an apology, but sorry, I injury. We did miscommunicate with each other. Um, I didn't think you were criticising me, but I'm glad we ironed it out anyway. And secondly, because I have my proclivities and I can't help myself, Lady of Shalott, with those potatoes, do try combining duck fat with butter. And don't use unsalted butter. They'll be wonderful. There we go. I love, these, I love these cooking tips at the end of every show. <laughs> it's become a sort of steady segment. I like it. <laughs> anyway, there we go. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, so I just have to say... Um... Cuck McNeilberg has said AM does have that um, prototypical stereotyped English accent. Well, really, because I, I, I traditionally come from the West Country, I should have a, um, a strong West Country accent, but for some reason I've always managed to avoid that. So I've, um, I, I sound completely different from everyone you know I grew up with. So um, that's, again, I have no idea why I have this accent. I just Just a um, natural aristocratic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Absolutely, absolutely not. Um, so, scary, <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be interesting. You and um, Mr. D could collaborate on a reactionary cookbook. Yes, I'd love to see that. <laughs> oh my! So um, yes. Anyway, um, thank you both, Columba and um, Marcus. I mean, really, considering how complicated this topic is, I think um, we've achieved something and been able to distill it into some form, whether it's digestible or not, is yet to be seen. <laughs> but um, 
we've we've managed to um condense it in some form even though as i'm sure the chat can uh, can empathize with us that there are so many disparate um historical threads that you have to weave together because we're not mm -hmm. following as with the previous stream with the house of cape a consistent um history of you know the expansion of the uh, the royal domain of france here we're talking about collapse implosion disintegration and the arrival of all these um vying authorities you know whether they be city states or whether they be um mm. independent families or whether they be crusader nations and again that's the uh, typical aspect of german history is that um you know, it's incredibly complicated and i think um sadly before really the the arrival of prussia german history is you know seldom even known in the west you know at all you know even even in germany which is yeah. which is quite incredible so um and, and, and often when it does it's caricatured it quite unfairly Absolutely. And um, just talking about the historiography of this moment, of course, this, is, of course, is seen as part of the uh, the Sonderweg, the idea of the, the German separate path, which, of course, leads to the teleology of National Socialism. But again, that's just, you know, another aspect of um, <laughs> German myth making and German historiography. It's um, Indeed. all these elements which we'll get into another time, surely. So all I can say is, again, thank you, Columba. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, everyone, very much for watching. Thank you for all the lovely super chats and good night. Oh, and Hi, guys. Um, Oh, no, no, sorry. I forgot. Um, last stream. So thank you, everyone, to... Sorry, that was my fault. I made you go back. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everyone, who patronizes the channel. It means so much. Um, do remember to like, um, leave a comment, and share this video. That, that again, really helps the channel out. Um, on Wednesday, I will be having Justine Brownover, a regular um, visitor of the channel, to discuss um, the history of Jacobitism after the fall of James II. So um, another little bit of hidden history there, if anyone wants to check in and um, watch that. And um, for the second time, thank you very much, Columba and Marcus, and um, good night. Good night, everyone. Take care.